Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats. Good afternoon. The devotional today will be led by Michael T. Brown II, who is a board member of the Alzheimer's Association of Vermont in Springfield. Precious memories, ah, how they linger, ah, how they ever flood my soul in the stillness. Of the midnight sacred scenes will unfold. I am so very happy to be here today as one of the newest residents of the state of Vermont. <laughs> I'm originally from Kansas City, and for many years, though, I lived across the border in New Hampshire until a beautiful, born and raised uh, Vermont middle school librarian stole my heart. <laughs> and now to paraphrase the state song, home is where the heart is, and these green mountains are now my home. <laughs> Why I moved to Vermont is a memory that I hope to tre treasure for the rest of my life, which is why I'm here today, and which is why I've joined the Alzheimer's Association in their fight for a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Because I've seen Alzheimer's and dementia and know that in all forms, it knows no bounds. I, with the other advocates who are here today, who are holding flowers, which represent their connection with the association. Blue, someone living with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. Yellow, a caregiver. Purple, they've lost someone to the disease. Or orange, they support the cause along with your colleagues who are wearing flower boutonnieres which were made by a Vermonter with early onset Alzheimer's, we are fighting for memories. We are fighting so that no person ever loses memories that they hold dear and treasure. And so that no caretaker ever has to have the memory of watching their loved one slowly die because of this disease. There's work to be done, and we all need your help to do it. Remember, Alzheimer's knows no party line. So let's fight together for the memories. Thank you. Members, we have one House bill for introduction today. House Bill 884 is an act relating to the modernization of governance for the St. Albans Cemetery Association introduced by the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. H884, an act relating to the modernization of governance for the St. Albans Cemetery Association. Now the bill has been read the first time and is placed on the calendar for notice on the next legislative day pursuant to House Rule 48. We also have three Senate bills for referral today. The first is Senate Bill 58, which is an act relating to public safety introduced by Senator Sears. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. 
S58, an act relating to public safety. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Next is Senate Bill 184, which is an act relating to the temporary use of automated traffic law enforcement ATLE systems introduced by Senator Gulick and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-184, an act relating to the temporary use of automated traffic law enforcement, ATLE, systems. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Transportation. And finally, Senate Bill 258, which is an act relating to the management of fish and wildlife, introduced by Senator Bray and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-258, an act relating to the management of fish and wildlife. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Environment and Energy. Uh, we have a bill on the notice calendar requiring, requiring referral to a money committee pursuant to House Rule 35A. House Bill 869 is an act relating to approval of the merger of Brandon Fire District Number 1 and Brandon Fire District Number 2. Materially affecting the revenue of one or more municipalities, the bill is referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Members, we have received a request to, re -read, to read a House concurrent resolution that the House and Senate adopted pursuant to the consent calendar. HCR 183 is a House concurrent resolution designating March 28, 2024 as Alzheimer's Awareness Day at the State House. Please listen to the reading of the resolution. Whereas Alzheimer's disease is a degenerative brain disease, the most common form of dementia, and nationally affects 6.9 million Americans aged 65 and older. And whereas the national cost of caring for these, those with Alzheimer's or other dementias is projected to be 360 billion in 2024. And whereas Vermont's per capita Medicare spending on people with dementia is $23,329, and whereas Vermont's Alzheimer's disease mortality rate is the third highest in the nation. And whereas the older population is the state's fastest growing demographic and approximately one in nine persons 65 years of age and older has Alzheimer's. And whereas 19,000 Vermonters provide an estimated 28 million hours of unpaid Alzheimer's care valued at 615 million. And whereas caregiving for individuals living with Alzheimer's or other dementias takes an enormous toll and dementia caregivers suffer more stress, depression and health problems than caregivers for the other illnesses. And whereas the total lifetime cost of care for someone with Alzheimer's or other dementias is estimated at several hundred thousand dollars and family caregivers assume a large percentage of these costs. And whereas advocates are visit visiting the State House today to raise awareness of the challenges associated with navigating Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, now therefore be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly designates March 28, 2024 as Alzheimer's Awareness Day at the State House. And be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to the Vermont chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Are there any announcements? Member from Springfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We heard the devotional this afternoon by Michael T. Brown II, uh, who is a, a fellow Mason and resident of Springfield. And uh, I think we all can agree uh, his uh, choosing Vermont as his poem is uh, certainly honorable. In 2019, Michael T. Brown II was thinking about his great granddaddy Horace, Grandma Craig, and his uncle, Dub. Horace Y. Brown, the grandfather, a World War II veteran and master of the grill, died of Alzheimer's when Michael was only two years old. Mary Craig Coffey, a woman known to be loved for her wit and wisdom and a dear figure in Michael's life, also died of Alzheimer's. And this year, Michael's uncle, Dub, William T. Williams, lost his battle with Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. To honor all three, Michael held a Facebook fundraiser on his birthday for the Alzheimer's Association. It was a start, but it wasn't enough. How many of us have thought, if only there was something more I could do? And then, how many of us have thought, hey, let's put on a show? 
It is the classical museum theater solution to all of life's problems that Michael, a graduate of Franklin Pierce Theater, suddenly had a new mission. A few months after Michael's flash of inspiration, he recruited a cast of 15 theater buddies, Michael T. Brown and friends, featuring a slate of songs about memory. Their stage was in the New London, New Hampshire Town Hall, but the team had heart, talent, and passion to spare, and by the end of the night, they had a hit on their hands. By the time Michael's second production, Michael T. Brown and Friends Go to Broadway, which opened in 2020, he had recruited New Hampshire walk manager Maria Stefano to show up on opening night with brochures and information about the walk to end Alzheimer's. The two productions garnered more than $2,500 for the Alzheimer's Association. Michael has become known throughout New England region, lending his enthusiasm and voice and highly visible purple cape, which he didn't bring today, <laughs> wherever they are needed and included. The Upper Valley Walk as MC and captain of the Colby Sawyer community team, at the Manchester Walk singing the national anthem and introducing the governor. As MC at the New, Re New England region's CS CMS rally for access last spring. As an advocate at the AIM Advocacy Forum in Washington, DC. As a powerhouse volunteer at the Alzheimer's Volunteer Summit in California. Makes you a statewide traveler. <laughs> Michael's voice not only is, his, is not only his amazing singing voice, but his capital P presence makes people stop what they're doing and tune in. For Michael, as for so many, the fight against Alzheimer's and all other dementia is not just a cause. It's a quest to make Alzheimer's, in Michael's words, a thing of the past. The battle is being conducted across many fronts to fund research to confront health inequities that affect black and brown Americans and to make sure that everyone has access to the new treatments that have finally shown promise. And on my behalf of uh, representing them from Springfield, Emmons, and myself, I would ask that the uh, House give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Will the guest of the member from Springfield please rise and be recognized? <laughs> member from Wilkett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is projected that there will be 17,000 individuals over the age of 65 living with Alzheimer's by 2025 in Vermont. That equates to each one of us having 113 constituents living with this disease. We each also have more than 126 constituents that provide thousands of hours of a year in unpaid care to a loved one living with Alzheimer's or another dementia. As a matter of fact, in 2022, those unpaid caregivers provided 28 million hours of care. Today we are joined by individuals living with Alzheimer's and other dementias, their caregivers, advocates, and representatives from our long-term care sector. They are working here in our community to destigmatize de this disease and to help enhance our system of care. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming them to the People's House. Will the guest of the member from Wilkett please rise and be recognized. <laughs> member from Lincoln. Madam Speaker, Sunday is International Transgender Day of Visibility, an annual event occurring on March 31st dedicated to celebrating transgender people and raising awareness of discrimination faced by transgender people worldwide, as well as a celebration of their contributions to society. Trans people face discrimination, hate, and threat of serious harm and death on a daily basis. The current cultural environment that enables and exacerbates this behavior is beyond a crisis level now. A national LGBTQ youth nonprofit group said crisis calls from, the Oklahoma, from Oklahoma more than tripled 
in the weeks after transgender student Nex Benedict died there on February 8th. The Trevor Project information says that LGBTQ plus young people are not inherently prone to suicide risk because of their sexual orientation or gender, gender identity, but Madam Speaker, rather placed at a higher risk because of how they are mistreated and stigmatized in society. LGBTQ plus young people are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers. In 2013, I co-led the Equal Care Coalition, inspired by a beloved nurse colleague experiencing harmful discrimination around health insurance, um, discrimination in the workplace. I worked with transgender people, healthcare providers, and through that work, we had legislation drafted. Um, we, uh, led by this nurse colleague, had conversations with hospital administration, and we had conversations with the Dep Department of Financial Regulation, and ultimately, through the DFR path, were able to um, improve and increase access for med medically necessary care for transgender people. 2019, um, that access was increased again um, for uh, LGBTQ or transgender youth, um, including mental health care. In 2021, I had the great privilege of working with a representative from Winooski banning the trans panic defense. One of the most beautiful experiences I continue to have in my life is the experience of utter joy I have felt from members of my community of queer people. Joy hard earned from living through experiences of people's misunderstanding, unwilling, unwillingness to learn, and overt hate. Joy from having the audacity to live their lives as who they are in the face of so many people forcefully demanding that they don't. There is an inexplicable sense of beauty and freedom when one has created, with the support of others, the ability to live fully and authentically. I owe much of the beauty in my life to the gifts my transgender and queer friends have given me. Madam Speaker, being in the legislature has been a gift. Even among and amidst intense disagreements, we get to know each other as individuals, hopefully able to and trying to live our authentic selves and authentic lives. So I ask that tomorrow we wear the colors of the transgender flag, light blue, light pink, and white. And I also ask now for a moment of silence as an opportunity for each of us to celebrate the contributions of transgender folks and consider how we can learn and grow from truly knowing our transgender friends. Transgender youth desperately need us, as adults, to model compassion and understanding. Their lives are depending on us. Well, members, please join me in a moment of silence. Are there any further announcements, member from Rutland City? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask this, this body and helping me welcome at 2.45 this morning, the birth of my granddaughter, Amelia Blake McGuire. Thank you. Oh, congratulations, <laughs> member. Member from Bradford. Madam Speaker, I have a guest in the balcony. Um, Patrick Harrigan moved to Bradford two years ago and has done an incredible job jumping into a, uh, support a wide variety of community volunteer efforts. 
Would the body please help me in welcoming him to the people's house? Will the guest of the member from Bradford please rise and be recognized? Are there any further announcements? Member from Fairfax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to wish everybody a very, very, very happy opening day. <laughs> Love that. Are there any further announcements? Seeing none. Orders of the day. Members, we are going to begin um, orders of the day with our 2025 budget. With that, and then uh, as we finish, as we wrap up that, I will uh, give you an update on bill order. Now we'll begin with House Bill 883, which is an act relating to making appropriations for the support of government. The bill was introduced by the Committee on Appropriations. The member from Virgins, Representative Lamfer, will speak for the committee and affecting the revenue of the state. The bill was then referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which recommends that the bill ought to pass. The member from Brattleboro, Representative Kornheiser, will speak for that committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. H883, an act relating to making appropriations for the support of government. Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Your House Appropriations Committee is here and ready to report on H883, which is the FY25 budget. The budget will be presented collectively and will yield from member to member as they report their sections of the budget. The members will report on the highlights of their areas and will not be stating the normal business pressures found in salaries, benefits, and pensions, unless truly unusual. You may find H883 on the legislative website. Additional helpful summary documents had been emailed to all House members over the last few days, and they can also be found on the, JF, the Joint Fiscal Office webpage under FY25 budget. This budget is not the work of one person or one committee. Before you is the collective work of every member in the House. It reflects the inputs, priorities, and commitments within the state's revenues. This budget so closely remains within the governor's recommend budget that after we transparently account for the $12 million pension plus payment, the difference in general funds is within a 0.2%, not even half of 1%, or about $3 million difference or less. This budget is balanced. Not that I should have to say this, because Vermont always balances its budget. It also assures all reserves are fully funded assures our commitment to the pension funds are met. The process of balancing a state budget each year that respects the values of Vermonters and the revenues within the Treasury at times can appear messy and loud, but that is how democracy works. The process has been engaging and alive with energy. The process includes and requires making very difficult choices, compromises, and listening to many voices. This budget is ready to be passed along to the Senate, where the process will continue. I would like to highlight for the body some of the many ways this budget achieves our commitment to the people we serve. This budget honors the commitment this body has made to childcare by restoring the $9 million base funding that was removed from the governor's recommendation. This alone was not an easy task to find within the budget and restore. Vermont State College, college's five-year promises that we made for transformation bridge funding, this budget keeps that fourth-year commitment to them with $10 million investment. 
Truth and Reconciliation Commission with a $1.1 million appropriation, something the administration agreed that they had left off as an error and helped us find. Emergency housing with an additional 20 million on the contingency of revenues upgrade list. This budget includes a redirection plans for ARPA dollars before the December 2024 deadline by instructing investments in $26 million to the Department of Public Safety Emergency Management for FEMA match and a municipal support of hazard mitigation. It has $30 million for uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board of ARPA dollars for production and preservation of affordable rental and home ownership units. $25 million to the Vermont Housing Finance Agency for middle income home ownership development program. We've tried this a couple of times. I hope it takes this time. All remaining funds of ARPA dollars will be reallocated with authorization of the Joint Fiscal Committee to existing ARPA funding programs. We have a section in language that any unfilled limited service positions funded with ARPA dollars will be abolished on July 1, 2024, and the monies will be reverted back to ARPA. This budget also sets aside $31 million in anticipation of the Pay Act, funds additional embedded mental health crisis specialists in the Department of Public Safety, and increases uh, mental health crisis workers within our DA systems. Provides the Secretary of State with the funding needed for the coming 2024 election year. Funding for food programs is a small investment. However, it is nowhere near as much as needed. Provides assistance for the logging industry with $1 million for a pilot expansion for road construction supports. Supports the funding needed to keep the Salisbury fish, fish hatchery open for one more year. You'll hear language in the capital bill on a study that um, neatly coordinates that effort. It is important to recognize the coordinated efforts between your House committee chairs, members, and leadership as we try to stay in tight communication as many bills move throughout the process. With their incredible policy advancements and associated required revenue investments, it is a pleasure to work with the members of the House Appropriations Committee. So let's hear from them as they walk through the sections of the budget. Madam Speaker, I am very proud to yield to the member from Callis. The member from Virgins yields to the member from Callis. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> it's uh, my pleasure to kick off this process. I'm going to present the sections of the budget, hopefully in a brief form, that actually represent almost a quarter of the total state budget because it includes the Department, the Agency of Education. Uh, I'll start with the Agency of Administration, then Human Resources, the Auditor, and the Department of Financial Regulation, and I'll present the highlights. And I'm going to reference pages of the bill itself, the big bill, which you can follow. But I will say the web report in some ways is the most informative. It doesn't have page numbers, but you can f I'll use the B numbers uh, and they kind of go in order. So the agency of administration. This is the agency that created the budget, the governor's budget and provides centralized financial services for the state government. It oversees for the state and its employees, workers' compensation insurance, general liability insurance, and all other insurance. The agency's $7.6 million budget is supported about one-third from the general fund and two-thirds 
from interdepartmental transfers and internal service funds. That is, payments that come from all the other state agencies that use the services of the agency of administration. By the way, part of its budget is the retired state employees pension plus funding, which increased from nine to 12 million. And the reason I mention it is because we funded, it comes from the general fund, and we funded it this year from what's called carry forward. That is unexpended funds from last year. Well, we won't be able to do that next year, so we're gonna have to find money in the general fund to fund it next year, and that will be more difficult. The Department of Human Resources, it's, just, it's the HR, it's, it's the HR entity for the whole state. Uh, government. It sets job class classifications, pay grades. It provides data on the state workforce. It recruits employees and it negotiates collective bargaining agreements. All again, all almost all of its budget is funded by internal service and special funds. That is again, payments received from all the other state agencies. And those increased substantially this year due to costs such as insurance. Insurance this year went up, just skyrocketed, not surprisingly, because of the floods. And as will be discussed by Representative Tolino later, these agencies, along with the state as a whole, suffer from very high vacancies. The, it, the nearly $16 million budget of this uh, HR uh, increased by about 15% this year. The auditor is pretty simple. That's the big bill, pages 18 to 19. The auditor's budget is almost entirely internal and special funds, consisting of increased salaries and benefits and minor operations for the 4% that it went up. It's largely not a general fund agency. The Department of Financial Regulation, you can find it B226 through 230. It's in the big bill, pages 37 to 39. This is an interesting agency. It's well run and it administers our regulatory programs for insurance companies, banking, securities, and what's called captive insurance. If you don't know, captive insurance is when a company decides to self-insure, essentially, to create its own insurance company. And this state specializes in the regulation of captive insurance being by far and away the having more captive insurance companies uh, domiciled here than any other state in the union and I believe any other nation. Um, the total number of employees of this agency hasn't changed. Their $19 billion, million dollar budget is up about 3% from last year. And it is also funded almost entirely from its own special fund into which these regulation fees and fines go. And this fund runs a substantial surplus of income over costs. The Department of Financial Regulation is budgeted to contribute approximately $58 million to the general fund this year because of that surplus. So finally, that takes me to an agency which accounts for about a quarter of our entire state budget, the Agency of Education. This huge, it's huge 2.9 billion, B as in billion, uh, B as in boy, uh, budget uh, comes almost entirely from the education fund. It's 80% education fund, 12% federal funds. So the general fund pays only about 8%. Um, and you can find in the web report at the end of the sections on education, which are B500 through 15, B515, big bills, pages 65 to, 60 to 71, but at the end of the web report, there's a one-page summary of the entire budget of the, of the Agency of Education. At this point, payment, the payment to local school districts, that's B505, 
the big bill, pages 67 to 68, is estimated to be, that, that is the payment that's a largely the result of their, each school district's budget, is estimated to be $1.9 billion, up $1.7 billion from last year, or about 12%. One of the sections that's important is special education. B502, it's in the big bill, page 66. Its costs were up substantially this year due to increases. This is something many of you have heard of in your committees. These are due to increases in the number of students receiving the services and the severity of their condition. Their budget is $265 million, again, supported by local taxes, up about 15%. So there are a lot of education sections, and most are set by formula, but I just want to name a few highlights for you. Adult education and literacy in the big bill, page 67, have been reconfigured and are now supported 60% by the general fund and 40% by the education fund, which is somewhat similar to what it is, its historic support. And uh, the community schools program, which you may have read about, is a pilot program which was previously federally funded it's now funded by $1 million from the education fund. So we're funding it. We've taken over its funding from the feds. B507 provides funds to what used to be called, for what used to be called small schools. And it's been renamed merger support grants. Um, and the, the amount has been substantially reduced. As provided in our BAA, our Budget Adjustment Act, the after schools grant program of four million in B509, that's the one that's derived from taxes on cannabis. It's now deposited in a special fund for that purpose. Um, the state teachers retirement system and healthcare benefits, I'll just say they are fully funded by a combination of general fund and education uh, funds. You can see that in pages 70 to 71 and 175 to 177. Um, overall, the grand total education fund is $2.96 billion, up 5.2% over last year. Now, Madam Speaker, I would like to yield the floor to my committee colleague, the member from St. Albans. The member from Callis yields to the member from St. Albans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> I will be reporting on the following sections of the bill. The Treasurer's Office, the Office of the Secretary of Human Services, the Human Services Secretary's Global Commitment, the Department of Health, the Department of Public Health, and the Green Mountain Care Board. My references for page locations in the bill are from the bill as introduced in the paper copy we received a couple of days ago at our desks. Section B1041 is for the retired state employees pension plus funding from the treasurer's office on page eight. This added the $12 million to the retirement fund instead of the amount of $9 million in the governor's recommend. Originally, the $12 million was appropriated from a carryover, but the committee agreed it was more transparent to future legislatures if we included the, the payment of $12 million needed in 2025 in the House recommendation. This pension plus amount will be added each year until 2038 to fully fund, fully fund the pension obligations. The language for this is in section C105 on pages 104 and 105. The OPEB or post-employment benefits portion of the retirement fund language is in section C106 on page 105 and 106. Section B131 for the treasurer's office is on page 19. 
There is one position added for an internal auditor. There is no general fund money for this position since the position will be paid for by the unclaimed property fund and the retirement funds. Language for this position is in section E100 on page 120. Section B132 is for unclaimed property in the treasurer's office and its budget reflects this new position in the operating expenses. Section B133 on page 20 for Vermont State Employees Retirement and B134 for Municipal Employees Retirement includes the cost of the internal auditor position and their respective operating expenses. On page 126, section E133 has language showing the operating budget for the retirement funds for the Vermont State Employees and the portion of the Vermont Pension Investment Commission's budget attributable to that pension fund. Section E-134 has similar language for the municipal employees and the cost of the operating expenses and the portion of the Vermont Pension Investment Commission budget attributable to that pension fund. Section B-134, page 20 and 21, is the budget for the Vermont Pension Investment Commission. There are no changes. This is the government recommend. Section B 300, Human Services, Agency of Human Services, Secretary's Office is on page 43. The section of the budget follows the governor's recommend and has some language to explain different parts of the budget. Section B 1100 and one, page 99, has language for the breakdown of mental health urgent care centers. This is one time money. Section D 101, B1, large B, page 116, has language for the transfer to the general fund from the AHS central office earned federal receipts. Section D, 102A, page 118, there is a reversion to the general fund from AAH, AHS COVID contingency. Section E, 300.1A, page 135, there is language for agreements with AHS with case management entities. In section E 300.3A, page 136, has several, has language that AHS shall provide coordinated information for several departments. Section E 300.4, page 137, there is language for development of a long-term plan for high-end system care for youth. And section E 300.5, page 137 to 138, there is language for fiscal year 2024 closeout and a child welfare information system. Section B 301, this is the Secretary's Office Global Commitment. This is the area of the budget known as the mixing bowl. It's on page 43 to 44. It is the part of the secretary's office that administers the global commitment grants for Medicaid. It operates under a federal waiver that allows the state flexibility in allocating Medicaid dollars. The House Appropriation Committee increased the total grants by $4,758,902. This includes both general and global commitment dollars. The list of grants added are on the web report which is available on the Joint Fiscal Office website. It includes Meals on Wheels, LUPA Medicare rates for Visiting Nurses Association Skilled Nursing, Department of Mental Health for Continuum of Care Funds, and Non-Emergency Medicaid Transportation Funding. Language for these services are on page 135, Section E 301.2 for home and community based services, Section C 102 and Section C 103 for home delivered meals, page 103, Section C 111 for non emergency Medicaid transportation funding on page 107 to 108. Section E 301C for AHS federal receipts holding account and section E 301.1 for a transport report, transfer report on global commitment appropriations. Both are on page 139. 
Section B303 is the Developmental Disabilities Council. That's on page 44. There are no changes. It's the government, governor's recommend. Section B304, Human Services Board, page 44. Again, no changes. The governor's recommend. Section B305, AHS, Administrative Board, page 45. No changes. Again, the governor's recommend. Section B311 for the Health Department, Administration and Support, page 47. This department sees a decline in federal funds. Section B1100, D1, 2, 3, 8, and 9 on page 95 and 96 has language for the one-time appropriations for opiate abasement special funds for corrections, grants to providers for substance abuse management, general fund appropriation for Bridges to Health program, and for Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey. P Section E311.1, Healthcare Professions Educational Assistance. This is pages 145 to 151. The language addresses the forgivable loans available to allied health professions with the use of global commitment funds in the Department of Health. Section B312, Department of Health, Public Health, is on page 47 to 48. The Department of Public Health also shows a decrease in federal funds in its grants expense and its revenue from special funds and federal funds. Section E312A, page 151 to 53, has language for the HIV AIDS funding. And in A4, it lists grants for syringe service programs. Section E312.2, Page 155 has language that addresses the Opiate Settlement Advisory Committee recommendations. Section B345 is the Green Mountain Care Board on page 63. There's no changes. It's the governor's recommend. Section E345, page 170 to 172. This language provides the change in the percentages of how the expenses for the Green Mountain Care Board is borne by the state hospitals, medical service corporations, insurance companies, health maintenance organizations, and the accountable care organization. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield to the member from Chittenden. The member from St. Albans yields to the member from Chittenden. Madam Speaker, last year, the member from Newport quietly included in his floor report the catchphrase, this is a really big deal. If you weren't listening carefully, you might have missed it. Well, I for one will have my ear open to the member's report on the off chance we have another slogan debut from the kingdom. Madam Speaker, I will be reporting on the Agency of Digital Services, building in general, uh, Building and General Services, Public Safety, E911, and the Department of Liquor and Lottery. First up is B105, the Agency of Digital Services, which can be found on page eight. We went with the governor's recommend. It includes appropriations for existing IT projects. B112 is the Department of Building and General Services starting on page 12. Governors recommend. Most of the changes in the governors recommend are for salary and benefit increases. If different, I will highlight. B113 and B113.1 for engineering, um, governors recommend. B114 information centers and B115 for purchasing are both governors recommend. On 115, the purchasing includes 595,000 annual cost for the Vermont Buys program, which will provide a new online purchasing portal for various state agencies to purchase their supplies more efficiently. B116 to B122, the remainder of the BGS sections are the governor, governor's recommend. The fee for space area, which is B122, includes an increase in property insurance of 1.3 million. 
in addition to the 1.9 million increases in salaries and benefits in this area. On to public safety, starting in B208 on page 28, governors recommend for the administration. The state police is in B209. This budget includes an increase in base funding to cover the full cost of the current 12 embedded mental health workers plus four out of the eight new ones proposed by the governor. The base budget in this section is 468,000 less than what the governor recommended. B two uh, sorry, B210 is the criminal justice services. It's the governor's recommend. This includes a new position for record checks, background record checks. B211 emergency management includes a new regional emergency management coordinator position and $16 million from FEMA towards last year's flooding. B212 and B213, uh, fire safety and the forensic laboratory are the governor's recommend. B-235 and B-236.1 on page 41. One is the e Enhanced 911 Board. Governors recommend and the 236.1 is Liquor and Lottery. Same page, also governors recommend. And B-100, uh, I'm sorry, 1100A-1 on page 94 there's a one-time appropriation for the Department of Public Safety of 12.5 million to be used as matching funds for FEMA grants. B1103, capital projects beginning on 100. This section appropriates 9.55 million from the capital cash fund to the Department of Building and General Services for several projects that mirror what is in the capital bill, H882, which we will hear tomorrow. This section takes projects that are allocated in the capital bill, which um, they allocate in 828, what did I say? 882, it, the money is appropriated in 883, um, as a way to reduce what we need to bond for and ultimately saves us money. C115 on page 110. This is an adjustment to the current year budget that we're in now. B1103 of last year's budget. It reduces the capital cash fund by 2.25 million of which under subsection nine, 600,000 is reduced from the prior appropriation for the correctional facility in Newport, uh, as they have three and a half million in bonded funds for this project already. Subsection two is a $250,000 reduction for the planning and design of the Department of Children and Families short-term stab stabilization facility, as they have remaining ARPA funds at their use. Subsection 18 is $800,000 reduction from the cash fund appropriation to fish and wildlife for improvements of the department's buildings, including conservation camps, and is transferred to the bonding portion of tomorrow's capital bill. Subsection B3 reduces what was appropriated to the Vermont State Colleges by $1 million for some of the building improvements as plans may change for Vail Hall at the Linden campus. Under D100, subsection 3C, and I'm guessing it's around page 114, sorry, I missed that. $436,000 to the Agency of Digital Services for Vermont Center for Geographic Information, it's a standard transfer each year. D101 and other transfers on page 115, subsection 1D is 1.4 million to the Fire Prevention Building Inspection Fund to cover a deficit 
in under subsection E, uh, 1.3 million to the enhanced 911 fund to cover a deficit. Just about done. E106, B1 on page 124 allows the Commissioner of Finance to revert unobligated and unspent ARPA funds for $36 million um, to emergency management for FEMA match and municipal support for hazard mitigation. E208 on page 130 is standard language for public safety to contract with the Essex Sheriff Department. In E208.1, ask public safety to report back on measurable outcomes on the results of the embedded mental health clinicians in state police and the coordination with designated agencies in mobile crisis response program. E209 and 212 on page 131 is standard language found in last year's bill. Madam Speaker, I would li now like to yield to the member from Middlebury, who also happens to be leading our committee with correct responses to our daily riddle. Thank you. The member from Chittenden yields to the member from Middlebury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will also primarily focus on top level highlights of my budget sections. I'll be referencing the pages of the 183 page bill itself and we'll go through the basic agency and departmental budgets found at the beginning of the bill first and then go through the language pieces in sections B, D and E afterwards. My major areas include tax, cannabis and higher education, but I also have a couple of administrative budgets, which is where I'm going to start. On pages 9 and 10, uh, and in the Agency of Administration is Finance and Management. They are the people that actually organize the whole state budget and present it to us in our committee room. Budget and Management and Financial Operations has just the typical increases for salary benefits, et cetera, and there's no change from the governor's recommended budget. On page 11, we have the libraries. Uh, again, it's the typical increases, and we accepted the governor's recommend. The tax department, the Department of Taxes is, is comprised of seven divisions and the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate. So they have the tax administration, which is where all the people are who do the work. They're located on page 11. And then on pages 22 to 24 are the rest of the tax departments, homeowners and renter rebate, reappraisal and listing payments, current use, and three pilot programs, payment in lieu of taxes. The committee accepted the proposed budget for all of these divisions, with the exception of the main tax department itself, which has the people and the raises, all of the other programs have been level funded. On page 42, section B240 is the Cannabis Control Board. You may recall in the Budget Adjustment Act earlier this year, we added two positions here. Funding for these positions was not included in the governor's budget, so we have added 204,000 for these two positions in 2025. All funds come from the Cannabis Regulation Fund and there is no general fund money involved. And then we have the 600 series, which is higher education, all on pages 72 to 74. This is UVM, the state colleges and VSAC. Uh, and they, the colleges and UVM got their 3% increase and everything else was level funded. And we agreed with the proposed budget in all cases in this area. And then uh, also in the B section, we have uh, debt service, B1000, located on page 94. The debt service is typically a very large number in the 70 to $80 million range. For FY25, as we did in the budget adjustment, we paid nearly all of the debt service via a transfer rather than an appropriation, which allowed us to free up about $3.5 million in general fund that would have gone to our reserves. Our reserves, we are ensuring that they remain healthy and they are filled up as required, but this is not a practice that we want to make permanent. So the 650,000 in this um, line item is related to bond issuance costs and they must be appropriated rather than transferred. And now for the language sections. In the one-time section on page 97 in B1100, uh, as mentioned earlier, we're appropriating $10 million to Vermont State University for transformation bridge funding, honoring our promise to them four years ago. This is the fourth year of a five-year commitment, and in FY26, this number will be reduced to $5 million. 
We also appropriate a million dollars to CCV for their tuition advantage program. In B1102 on page 100, we offer contingent appropriations if there is carry forward an unobligated general fund at the end of fiscal year 24. We've prioritized two items here, 20 million to DCF for GA emergency housing programs and three and a half million to the Department of Public Safety Flood Resilient Communities Fund for grants to residential or commercial structure elevation projects. Moving to section D, which is where fund transfers and reserve allocations are located. On page 113 is D100, which relates to the property transfer tax. Here we make several transfers, all of which we make every year. We make in a, a, a little over 575,000 to the current use special fund, just over 22 million to for the Mont Housing Conservation Board, of which 2.5 million is used for debt payments on the affordable housing bond this body and the, the, the General Assembly approved uh, about five years ago. We give uh, 7.8 million to the municipal and regional planning fund, and then those are, that money is further transferred so that 6.4 million goes to the regional planning commissions, 932,000 goes to municipal planning grants, and just over 400,000 goes to the Agency of Digital Services for the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. On section D101, on pages 114 to 116, we have some other fund transfers, which include uh, the money from the general fund to what is now the General Obligation Bonds Debt Service Fund in the amount of just over $73 million. This is the money I mentioned earlier that is being transferred rather than appropriated to pay our debt service. We transfer uh, from the general fund to the Tax Computer Modernization Fund, 1.8 million, from the Ed Fund to the Tax Computer Fund, 1.4 million, and from the Local Options Process Fees Fund to the Tax Computer Modernization Fund, 2 million. We do these transfers, these three, every year. And then from the Cannabis Regulation Fund, the general fund is receiving $12 million. The original proposal from the governor was for 10 million, but we were able to transfer an additional 2 million to the general fund, thanks to the ongoing success of our regulated cannabis program. Finally, I have a couple of pieces of section E beginning on page 139. On pages 139 to 143, there are several tax department sections that relate to our pilot programs found back in section B. This is our standard annual language, and they're all level funded, as previously mentioned. And on pages 176 to 178, we again have UVM, the state colleges, and VSAC. Again, this is standard annual language, both regarding our payments to these organizations and how the funds must be used. And now, Madam Speaker, I would like to yield to the member from Burlington. The member from Middlebury yields to the member from Burlington. Madam Speaker. <clears throat> I am presenting sec eight sections of the budget related to the legislative branch, um, VDH substance use programs, and the Department of Mental Health, and ACCD's Department of Housing and Community Development. Beginning with the branch we know the best. <clears throat> um, turning, <clears throat> so sections B125 through 128, which can be found on pages 16 to 18 in the bill, <clears throat> We made no changes to these budgets, which total 22.3 million, an increase of over last year of 1.67 million. And as is true in many of the state budgets that we reviewed, um, the lion's share of the increase is due to increased proper, uh, sorry, increased health care costs, um, premiums, defined benefit contributions and salaries. To reduce the annual increase to a rate closer to the administration's goal of 3%, $814,000 from carry forward in these departments were reverted to the general fund. There's just one new budgeted position, an audiovisual IT specialist. Other personnel shifts are cost neutral. Um, two session only law clerk positions were combined into a year round exempt full time position and one vacant attorney position was transferred from ledge council to human resources. Turning now to the Department of Health Substance Use Programs budget, <clears throat> which can be found 
in section B313 of the web report or on page 48 of the bill. The FY25 budget is $6 million less than FY24 because of a drop in COVID-related funding. Fortunately, this drop is softened by the existence of special funds that we're all familiar with, among them the Tobacco Settlement Fund, the Evidence-Based Education and Advertising Fund, and the Opioid Settlement Fund, each framed to address different needs. The bud beginning with a base budget, the budget in B313 reflects one change to the governor's proposed base budget, which includes an appropriate, which included an appro appropriation of 1.5 million to fund prevention coalitions. The base already in carries 1.4 million for this purpose. We added to that an additional 795k from the opioid settlement fund for the same purpose, bringing the totals for prevention coalitions to 2.2 million. This enabled us to make two critical base investments in recovery housing and a new grants manager position at the Department of Health. Recovery housing is a core recovery resource. It has been funded in past years with one-time funding. This has significantly compromised the ability of recovery homes to retain staff and operate at full capacity, which weakens our recovery system. So by funding it as part of the base, we strengthen it. And the gift of the Opioid Settlement Fund is the opportunity to do more to prevent addiction, facilitate treatment, and support recovery. Its challenge is the amount of time it takes to develop the scope and parameters of grant programs and to provide oversight and support to funded providers. <clears throat> Concerning opioid abatement settlement funding priorities, in FY24, the budget appropriated 8.1 million from the opioid settlement fund to support a number of initiatives and resources. <clears throat> this year's recommended appropriations, which can be found on pages 95 and 96 of the bill, total 6.1 million. Finally, <clears throat> section E, 3112.2 on page 155 of the bill, amends statute concerning the process of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee. The language clarifies that the advisory committee shall vote on recommendations for spending opioid abatement settlement funding, and if those recommendations are supported by a majority affirmative vote, <clears throat> the advisory committee will submit its recommendations concurrently to the Department of Health and to relevant committees in the General Assembly. The budget for the Department of Mental Health can be found in section B314 of the web report or on page 49 of the bill. We added $1.1 million to the base in global commitment to support community mental health crisis. <clears throat> this funding is supported by reducing by half the governor's request to embed an additional eight mental health professionals in the state police. The House Health Committee recommended this split to further strengthen the continuum of care within our communities, <clears throat> which are on the receiving end of police interventions and responsible for delivering services over the long haul. As noted on page 95 of the bill, the budget also includes two one-time appropriations, a $1 million appropriation to support startup costs related to the youth inpatient psychiatric facility in Bennington <clears throat> that we funded last year, and a global commitment of 483,000 to support independent mental health urgent care centers, which provide support for individuals experiencing acute mental health crises who can be served safely outside an emergency department. On page 95, the Department of Mental Health is required to report data on each of the centers and to make recommendations for future funding needs. <clears throat> You'll be happy to know. This is the last part of my presentation. We are turning now to the Department of Housing and Community Development within the Agency of Commerce, which can be found on eight, page 81 of the bill or in section B802 of the web report. House appropriations made no changes to the base budget of 32.5 million, which because of reductions in federal and special funding is about 700K lower than last year. In one-time appropriation, the governor's budget 
proposed $6 million to fund the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, $2 million to support improvements in manufactured housing, and $2 million to increase downtown tax credits from three to five million. Through the course of testimony and correspondence with DHCD in late February, we learned that the Department of Housing and Community Develop has carried forward $18 million in general fund money dedicated to the VHIP program, having used ARPA money, uh, having spent down ARPA money first. <clears throat> DHCD estimated that this funding would enable it to make commitments through March of 2025. It wasn't an easy decision, but in light of this significant carry forward, the committee's need to fill the budget gap and anticipation of the significant housing investments that will be possible through H829, the budget zeroes out this appropriation, maintains the downtown tax credit at its current level, and reduces the manufactured housing investment by $1 million. Overall, I would note that the budget reflects a $33 million investment in housing, construction, and rehabilitation, $14 million through <clears throat> the PTT that's dedicated to housing, $18 from VHIP, $1 from manufactured housing. And now, Madam Speaker, I would like to yield to the member from Brattleboro. The member from Burlington yields to the member from Brattleboro. Thank you, member. Madam Speaker, in my experience, your House Appropriations Committee enters into our budget work with intention and effort directed at the salient issues of the session while simultaneously seeking to sustain our efforts on the long-term strategic and programmatic decisions we have made previously. Turning the curve on complex problems often takes generations of steadiness, attentiveness, and adaptation. Sometimes we are more constrained in the choices we have in front of us. In my opinion, this has been one of those years. And in the areas I will report on, this shows up as very few changes to the governor's budget recommendations. I will update you on the budgets of the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, major parts of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Secretary of State, the Department of Labor, the VOSHA Review Board, the State Labor Relations Board, and the Criminal Justice Council. These branches of government support much of the richness of what it means to participate in civic life, to work, to eat, and grow in Vermont. I feel extraordinarily, luck extraordinarily lucky to hold this portfolio for our committee, and I'm pleased to share with you the recommendations of your House Appropriations Committee. I will begin with the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets, their section of the budget, which is in, sec in the B sections 222, 223, 224, 225, 225.1 and 225.2, all to be found on pages 34 to 36 of the bill. Much of the work of the agency is funded by fees and federal grants, and typically their budget is relatively stable and routine. Through our base agricultural budget, we fund food safety and inspections, essential grant programs for water quality, and farm and food business development, our agricultural lab, and many more services which support our working lands and the Vermont we value. House Appropriations accepted all of the base funding requests, which includes some appropriations which were highlighted by your House Committee on Agriculture, Food Resiliency, and Forestry, and have typically been of considerable interest to this body. Fairs and field day stipends, farm to school, and working lands come to mind. In the one-time appropriation section of the budget, B1100M on page 99, there is a new appropriation of one-time funds to the agency to be regranted to NOFA for the Crop Cash, Crop Cash Plus, and Farm Share programs. As described by the letter of support from House Ag, these programs provide subsidized CSA shares to low-income Vermonters, draw down federal dollars, and expand access to healthy local food grown in Vermont, all while supporting the farmers who produce the food. Every dollar spent on local food has a 1.6 multiplier in the local economy. Turning towards ACD, you will find the budget details in the B800 to B806 sections on pages 80 and 81. I will be speaking to most aspects of the ACCD budget except for housing, which was just recently addressed by the member from Burlington. The House Appropriations Committee agreed to the governor's budget request for ACCD in B800 administration and in B806 tourism and marketing. 
The year-over-year -year changes were technical in nature. We did make one substantive change to the governor's budget in B801 based on the recommendation of the House Commerce Committee letter. The governor proposed a $350,000 pilot program, which was detailed in House Bill 708 and referred to as the Capital Investment Loan Pilot Program. H708 did not move, and the committee did not support this pilot program at this time. B135 on page 21 is the State Labor Relations Board. The Labor Relations Board is charged with resolving labor relations disputes for state government, UVM, the Vermont State Colleges, municipalities and school districts, and some private employers under a number of different statutes. We accepted the governor's proposed budget. B136 on page 21 is the VOSHA Review Board. The VOSHA Review Board provides reviews of and hearings on Vermont Occupational Safety and Health Administration, otherwise known as VOSHA, violations of safety and health standards in the workplace that are contested by Vermont employers. It is not the program itself, which is administered through the Department of Labor. The Review Board is the appeal process for decisions made by the VOSHA program. We accepted the governor's proposed budget. B232 on page 39 is the Secretary of State's office. As you all know, the Secretary of State has a prominent role in our elections. The office also is a crucial part of economic development through the corporate division and the business portal and through workforce where it also houses the Office of Professional Regulation, which manages the process of ensuring licensure for Vermont's regulated professions. As the body has heard multiple times this year, how we regulate professions and interact with other states around licensure compacts shows that the work of this office is a crucial part of our workforce system. We accepted the base budget as recommended and added three one-time appropriations and two positions to address several key areas of need within the Secretary of State's portfolio. You can find the one-time appropriation, one appropriations on page 119. In B1100K1, we add one million to be granted to the Vermont Access Network. As you likely all know, the Vermont Access Network provides significant access to important civic events around the state through community media. Work is underway to update the revenue mechanism for this crucial function, and this appropriation is intended to serve as a bridge until we implement a more sustainable fund source. In B1100K2, we add 300,000 to support the 2024 elections. The estimated cost for the 2024 election cycle is 800,000. The governor's budget did not have a specific line item for the 2024 elections, preferring to count on the ability of the Secretary of State to find other sources of funds and carryover and vacancy savings. We chose to be sure that there were sufficient funds appropriated to cover this presidential election year. In recent years, we have made policy changes to improve voter participation, the most relevant of which is universal mailing of ballots, which will cost approximately 600,000 this year. In section C112 on page 109, we also give the Secretary of State spending authority to use unexpended funds from the 500,000 we appropriated early this year in H850. We gave that 500,000 to use to offset school districts' costs of rewarning school budgets. Most of this money should still be available, but final amounts will not be known until later next month. In B1000, sorry, 1100, K3, we add 67,000 to address the capacities needed to adjust to all of the compacts and workforce changes we have made within the Office of Public Regulation. These professional regulation, sorry. These costs were identified in the fiscal notes on our compacts. The Secretary of State is also getting two new positions found in section E100 on page 120. One will be to support communications with the public. The demand on the office has accelerated in recent years, whether it is from heightened scrutiny around recent elections or to one of the other major public facing divisions, business services, the Office of Professional Regulation and the Vermont Records and Archives. The second position is an IT position, which was recommended after a third party review of their IT capacity. There are currently only two dedicated IT positions and the third position will mitigate the risk of IT systems failure, work on cybersecurity and help support the four major IT projects they are currently implementing. 
Now we'll take a small step from the Secretary of State to a special form of licensure and training, which is for law enforcement. That's B221 on page 34, which is the budget of the Criminal Justice Council. The Criminal Justice Council is the state entity for law enforcement training, licensure, and decertification. The CJC establishes policies, certification standards, and trainings in the criminal justice sector. We accepted the budget as recommended. And now, our, finally, our workforce adjacent tour continues with the Department of Labor, found at B400 on page 63. The Department of Labor provides many services to the state and in support of its federal mission, from direct case management services, funding for many of our nonprofit workforce providers, a robust data program, enforcement of Vermont's labor laws, and management of our unemployment insurance program, the department has a full plate. The recommendation was accepted as proposed. And finally, last week, I shared with the body our intention to ensure we would have language in the budget regarding the two positions in H707, which will make up the new Office of Workforce Expansion and Innovation. I read draft language during my floor report, which you can now find in section E400 on page 172 of the bill. And with that, Madam Speaker, I yield to the member from Waitsfield. The member from Brattleboro yields to the member from Waitsfield. Thank you, member. Madam Speaker, I am presenting seven sections contained in the budget bill as introduced. The Ethics Commission, the Public Service Department, the Vermont Community Broadband Board, the Public Utility Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living in the Agency of Human uh, Ser Services and the Commission on Women. The budget for the Ethics Commission can be found in section B136.1 on page 22. The Ethics Commission is responsible for providing services related to ethics related advice guidance and complaints, complaint services. The House Appropriations Committee accepts the administration's recommended budget. The next three budget sections are the public utility budgets, including the Public Service Department, sections B233 on page 39, the Vermont Community Broadband Board, which is part of the Public Service Department, sections B233.1 on page 40, and the Public Utility Commission, sections B234 on pages 40 to 41. The Department of Public Service, or the DPS, is the state's energy planning and public advocate office. The department is self-funded, funded largely from special funds. There are no general funds used in this budget. The Department of Public Service houses the Vermont Community Broadband Board, which coordinates broadband deployment statewide. It is also self-funded using a universal service fund and no general funds. The Public Utility Commission, or PUC, is a quasi-judicial commission that focuses on ensuring that the provision of high-quality public utility services in Vermont at reasonable costs for the long-term public good of the state. The PUC is also self-funded using a special fund and no general funds. We accept the administration's recommended budge budgets for these three public utility budgets. The Human Rights Commission budget can be found in sections 236 on page 41. The Human Rights Commission conducts impartial investigations of alleged discrimination and educates parties on the requirements of state and federal law and resolves complaints. We accepted the administration's recommended budget for the Human Rights Commission. The budget for the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, also referred to as DALE, can be found in seven sections, in B329 to B334.1 on pages 55 to 58. DALE's fundamental role is to fulfill the commitment that we have made to individuals with disabilities and to older Vermonters, enabling them to receive supports and services in their homes and in their communities, living independently and fully in their communities. Section B329 is the Administration and Support Office and Budget, found on page 55. We agreed with the administration's request. Uh, Section B330 is the Adult Services Division budget that supports older Vermonters and adults with disabilities, found on page 56. The budget reflects our agreement with the administration's recommendation 
to move $542,000 of ongoing funding for the Supports and Services at Home program, often referred to as, referred to as SASH, from the Agency of Human Services central office budget back to the Dale budget. SASH is a wellness program that provides services and supports to our older Medicare recipients living at home. This is not an increase, rather it is an ongoing amount and most recently it had been part of the AHS central office budget. The adult services division also manages the $1 million of base general funds that goes to the areas ages, uh, the area agencies of aging to support senior meals, often referred to as Meals on Wheels program, a nutrition program for older Vermonters or those with chronic conditions or disabilities. These are the folks that among us that are most vulnerable and most food insecure of our neighbors. To help address the chronic underfunding of the Meals on Wheels program, the House Appropriations Committee agreed with the House Human Services Committee's recommendation to use that existing $1 million of general base funding that we put in the budget last year as match in our Global Commitment Investment Fund. If approved, the $1 million of general funds will be able to draw down federal funds as part of the Global Commitment Investment Fund that would result in having 2.4 million available to support our senior meals without any additional general funding. The member from St. Albans referred to the authorizing language for this, uh, this leveraging in section C103 on page 103. S sections B331 on page 56 and B332 on page 57 are two additional divisions. The first one, 331, is the Blind and Visually Impaired Division, the division that assists those who are blind or visually impaired to meet employment and independent goals. B332 is the Vocational Rehabilitation Division, now known as Higher Ability, is the division whose mission is to help Vermonters with disabilities Pre prepare for, obtain, and maintain careers, and to help employers recruit, train, and retain people with disabilities. We accepted the governor's recommended funding levels for these two budgets. Section B333 is the Developmental Services Division budget. The division administers services for people with developmental dis disabilities, and you can find that budget on page 57. We accepted the governor's recommendation. Section B334 is the Traumatic Brain Injury Program that provides rehabilitation and life skills services to those with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. That budget can be found on page 58. We accepted the governor's recommendation. Section B334.1 is the Long-Term Care Program, also known as Choices for Care. This program supports older Vermonters and people with physical disabilities at their homes in an enhanced residential setting or nursing facility. The administration budget recommendations include the, follow, the following. The statutory inflationary rate increase for nursing homes, a skilled nursing facilities rate method stabilization proposal, you may recall that for the past few budget adjustment cycles, we have seen the need to fund what we call extraordinary or extraordinary financial relief, EFR, to help in the operations of nursing homes that includes covering the cost of traveling nurses. This proposal involves adjusting the occupancy rates at nursing homes from 90% to 80%, freeing up $9.9 .9 million up front and potentially avoiding the EFR requests in future budget cycles that could include less reliance on traveling nurses. This budget also includes case load pressures. And finally, it includes eye care health network costs and special rate incentives. These funds are to support delivering specialized care for Vermonters with complex care needs who struggle to find placement in a nursing facility in Vermont. For example, these individuals need skilled nursing care but may need mental health supports, may have had previous involvement with the justice system, or perhaps they are in incarcerated in hospital emergency rooms or reside in an out-of-state facility because there's no alternative in-state placement available. This investment will ease the pressure on, on our skilled nursing facilities. 
We agreed with the administration's request for this, um, this uh, sector. My final budget is the Commission on Women, which you can fi find on section B343 on page 62. The Commission on Women is an independent, nonpartisan state agency that works to advance the rights and opportunities for women in Vermont. We also concur with the governor's recommendation budget, recommended budget. Madam Speaker, I would like to yield to the member from Underhill. The member from Waitsfield yields to the member from Underhill. Center. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will be reporting on the criminal justice system areas and agency of natural resources, except the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I will primarily be referencing the B numbers in the web report and page numbers of the bill as appropriate. In my comments on the following criminal justice components, I will identify the appropriations that are contained in H 880, access to justice that we discussed on Tuesday on this floor. B200, the Attorney General's Office, uh, we added 4,300 was added to the base budget to support 50% of the cost of victims advocate uh, that is currently being borne by the Center for Crime Victim Services. We made no other changes to the governor's recommend. B201, court diversion, uh, part of uh, H880, there was an appropriation of 397 1,400 for a position for the new pre-charge diversion program found in H645 and additional grants to community justice centers to address current and projected caseload pressures. pressures. Uh, there are no other changes to the governor's recommend. B202, public defender, and B203, pub, uh, defender general assigned counsel. We had a number of uh, appropriations in H880, which totaled uh, 1,344,700. Uh, we also had a one-time uh, backfill of the Public Defense Special Fund of 150,000. Uh, there are no additional changes to the governor's recommend. Uh, B204, Judiciary. Again, uh, there were no changes to the governor's recommend, but we did have an appropriation in H880 of 2,261,000. $500. In B205, state's attorneys, uh, no changes to the governor's recommend other than what was found in H880, uh, which was, a, was an appropriation of $1,701,000. B206, special investigative unit, no changes to governor's recommend. Crime victim advocates was included in uh, the $1.7 I referenced above. Uh, B207 sheriffs, uh, no change to governor's recommend. Uh, B220 center for crime victim services. In uh, H880, uh, we had added uh, 42,700 for a grants administrative position and a one time $300,000 backfill for their sexual violence, domestic violence special fund. Corrections, uh, at B335, administration, no changes to the governor's recommend. B336, corrections, parole board, no changes. B337, uh, correctional education, no changes. And B338, correctional services, uh, which is the largest part of a corrections budget of $171 million. Uh, we did have an appropriation in H880 uh, of 300,000 for six positions for the support of remote hearings. We also added uh, 200,000 for the Prison Rape Elimination Act training program and 500,000 for sex offender treatment program. Both programs are contracted programs. Uh, 338.1, Corrections Justice Reinvestment 2. Uh, we added uh, 750,000 for the community justice centers and the restorative justice part of the budget line. This was to make up for some one-time appropriations over the last couple of years and wanted to make them whole going forward in base budgeting. Uh, B339, correctional services out of state beds, no changes. B340, correction, correctional facilities, recreation, no changes. Uh, 341, Vermont Offender Work Program, no changes to the governor's recommend. 
It's about a $1 million down of personal services as he downsized the work program and have reassigned to other, other, other responsibilities in the DOC administration and correctional services budget lines. Uh, many of these being involved in, in increase in vocational programming. Next is the Agency of Natural Resources, B700, administration, no changes to the governor's recommend. B701, uh, Agency of Natural Resources, stand, state land, local property tax assessment, no change. Uh, B703, Forest Parks Recreation Administration, no changes to the governor's recommend. B704, again, Forest Parks and Recreation Forestry, no changes to the governor's recommend, although we do have a one-time uh, uh, addition, a water quality assistance program pilot to provide financial assistance to logging contractors with an amount of $1 million. You can find that information on page 99 of the budget. Uh, B705, Forest Parks, Recreation, State Parks. Uh, no changes to the governor's recommend. However, I would like to point out that uh, FPR eliminated uh, eight seasonal parks employees and created four classified permanent positions. Shifting toward more permanent year-round staff was one of the recommendations in the 2023 parks modernization study. And B706, uh, Lands Administration and Recreation, no changes to the governor's recommend, but I'll make note that there's a $7.3 million increase in the FY25 operating expenses, an offsetting increase in federal funding for the acquisition of two land parcels, Worcester Woods 3 and a Chateauguay parcel. B708, uh, Forest and Parks Access Roads, no change to the governor's recommend. And B709, Management and Support Services of Environmental Conservation. Uh, no changes to the governor's recommend, but also wanted to mention that three limited service positions are being converted to classified permanent positions, two dam safety engineers, and one geologist. Uh, uh, B710, uh, this is uh, DEC, Air and Waste Management. No changes to the governor's recommend, uh, but we'll note that there's some uh, increase because of a bipartisan infrastructure law funding for Brownfield's uh, work in their uh, federal funding. B711, Environmental Conservation Office of Water Programs. No changes in governor's recommend. However, uh, we have a federal funds increase. Uh, last year was 61.48 in FY24. This year is $107 million. Majority of this increase is related to the bipartisan infrastructure law for significant efforts within ANR's existing state revolving loan programs, Brownsfields program, and Superfund sites. Uh, we have some one-time appropriations, a Healthy Homes Initiative of $2 million. You can find this on page 97. Uh, we capitalized the Unsafe Dams Fund of $1 million. That's on page 115. And we have a state match for funding through the Water Resources Development Act for a recovery planning and implementation study for the Lunitsky River watershed long-term vision for watershed resilience and the amount of 500,000, and that can also be found on page 97. Uh, the last one, B713, Natural Resources Board. Uh, no change uh, to the governor's recommend, but there is a one-time uh, transfer of 600,000 to cover projected FY25 fees, Act 250 fees fund deficit. Madam Speaker, I now yield to the member from Newport, Representative Page. The member from Underhill yields to the member from Newport City. Madam Speaker, we continue our appropriations journey on the following five sections, which can be found on page 31 through 33. It deals with our Vermont National Guard's budget. We begin first with B215, the military administration. Military department's administration budget represents an overall increase of a, over $127,000, or about 4.2% from fiscal year 24. Majority of the funds come from the general funding. And this portion of the Guard represents 
the administration of the Vermont Guard for day-to-day -day activities of serving, protecting, and defending the citizens of our communities, our state, and nation. The administration component has seven employees, which makes up the Adjutant General's office. Within this area of the administration budget is funding for the Vermont National Guard's tuition benefit program amounting to $1.3 million, which is dispersed to the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation for National Guard tuition benefit programs. It offers certificate training or continuing education programs to active guard members attending Vermont universities, colleges, or eligible training institutions. For each full academic year funded, each recipient will commit to two full years of service with the Vermont Guard. This is also a major recruiting tool for the Guard. In addition, there is also funding that's been appropriated to, um, and it's um, for the USS Vermont Support Group, which totals $10,000. The second item in the Vermont National Guard budget is B216. It's for the Air Service Contract. Military Department's Air Service Contract budget represents an overall increase of um, over $1.4 million, $1 million, or about 14.4% from fiscal year 24. Majority of the funds come from the federal funding. Within this portion, the Air Service Appropriation supports the Vermont Air National Guard and its facilities through six major programs. And here are just a few of those items of interest within this budget. The Air Facilities Operation and Maintenance Program supports approximately 450,000 square feet of Vermont Air National Guard facilities and infrastructure to include maintenance of facility systems related to flying missions, snow removal on taxiways, and ensuring that the Air Force and industry standards for buildings that house specialized equipment. The Fire Protection Services provides aircraft rescue and firefighting services for all Air National Guard aircraft facilities and equipment. It also provides first response for the Northeast area of the city of South Burlington and heavy rescue services for the city of Winooski. And finally in this section, there's the star base program, which is to improve math and science skills for students who are historically underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and math. The program starts at the elementary school level to attract and prepare students at an early age for careers in engineering and other science-related fields of study. Third item in the Vermont National Guard budget is B-217 Army Service Contract. This budget represents an overall increase of $4.6 million or about 9.5% from fiscal year 24. Majority of the funds come from uh, the federal funding. The appropriations funds many Army National Guard programs including facilities, operations, and maintenance, environmental, training, security, and more. The majority of these programs are 100% federally funded, with some exceptions depending on the facility. From 50 to 75 to 100% are federally funded. As you review this budget, keep in mind that federal funding within this area also um, includes the next section from B218. This is basically for ease in, account, in their accounting purposes. The Army Service Contract Appropriation supports the Vermont Army National Guard and its facilities through, to, through a wide range of programs. The department has several ongoing major military construction projects that are 100% federally funded. There are approximately nine projects currently in design phase, and they'll be scheduled for construction between fiscal year 24 through 26. Some of those programs 
are the Family Services Center at Camp Johnson, improvements to the biathlon at Ethan Allen training site, a new readiness center or armory in, Lund in Linden, and these projects, again, are 100% federally funded through military construction cooperative agreements. The fourth item in the Vermont National Guard budget. This is the state matching program, which I mentioned earlier. The military department uh, fiscal year 25 budget represents an overall increase of over $108,000 or about 6.3% from fiscal year 24. Majority of the funding, as I said, comes from general funding. This portion is Vermont's cost share of the facilities program, which includes 50% of all maintenance and operating expenses for our state armories. For every dollar of general fund spent under this program, the state will receive one to three dollars in federal funding, which are in the previous account of B217. With the support of federal and state dollars, the program funds the construction, maintenance, and operations of facilities and land used by the Vermont National Guard. This again is Vermont's portion of its maintenance costs to the armories located throughout our state. The fifth and final item in the Vermont National Guard budget is a decrease actually of 23,000 or about minus 1.7% from fiscal year 24. Majority of the funds here come from general funding. This appropriations funds 13 full-time employees at the Office of Veterans Affairs and the Veterans Memorial Cemetery. 10 positions are 100% general funded, one is 100% federal funded, and two are paid with a mix of general funding and special funding. The office supports more than 40,000 Vermont veterans through several programs that include assisting veterans in applying for federally, federal disab disability benefits and survivor benefits. Maintain, it also maintains nearly 200,000 military discharge records from World War II to the present which includes the, the well-known DD-214s. Recognition programs for veteran services include a medals program, high school diplomas, veteran license plate verifications, and veterans, veterans assistance funding to assist low-income veterans. The Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Northfield Center, Vermont, is maintained by the state, and reimbursements are made from the department of Veterans Affairs. Two newly created positions um, are also in the process of processing the number of claims uh, for the PAC Act, which is a new law that has expanded VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and other toxic substances. In addition, there are um, other appropriations um, to the Veterans Affairs Office. There is $1,000 that shall be used for the continuation of the Vermont Medal Program. $2,000 shall be used for the expenses of the Governor's Veterans Advisory Council. $7,500 shall be used for the Veterans Day Parade. And $10,000 shall be granted to the American Legion for the boys' state and girls' state program. We now move to page 44 through 46. The following four sections are part of the Department of Vermont Health Access's budget. And we lead off with B306. Um, <coughs> as I said, the Vermont Health Access Administration. Here, majority of the funds come from federal funding as well as general funds. Just a reminder, DEVA, Department of Vermont Health Access, exists within the state of Vermont's Agency of Human Services. 
and is responsible for administering the Vermont Medicaid Health Insurance Program and Vermont State-Based Exchange for Health Insurance. The fiscal year staffing budget consists of 378 positions, six temporary positions. It also includes reclassifying salary changes, all benefit cost changes, including health care and retirement, as well as the new child care and family leave insurance. There are higher recruitment and the retention costs since the vacancy level is half of what it was last year. There are two neutral transfers between DIVA and the Agency of Human Services Central Office. Medicaid Policy Unit is also moving to the Agency of Human Services and there are quality positions being transferred to DIVA. Operating expenses and interdepartmental transfers are charges from other departments for shared support services and overhead allocation changes. There's also the operating expenses associated with the Medicaid policy unit, such as staffing costs that are moving to the Agency of Human Services Central Office. The second area of DIVA's budget is B307, the Medicaid program, global commitment. The state of Vermont's Agency of Human Services has a unique agreement with the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services where there is a global commitment to health. It is a partnership between the state and the feds where Vermonters have greater access to health care services a more stronger healthcare system and foundation in supporting our healthcare providers, particularly during disruptions such as COVID-19 pandemic. The global commitment funds that Vermont receives are extremely important when it comes to providing funding for public health, healthcare and services, whether Vermonters are enrolled in Medicaid or Medicare or have commercial insurance or are underinsured. Everything within this budget is covered under the Medicaid program's global commitment funds. One major task in this budget is reviewing and reclassifying or what is called redetermining Medicaid eligibility, which is going back to annual redeterminations for Medicaid eligibility. As many of you know, I'm often referred as the big deal because I referred to this process last year as a big deal, as the pandemic had been declared ended, which meant that all individuals which had qualified Medicaid might not still qualify. DIVA began this process of redeterminations last year and is expected to complete its task by the first quarter of fiscal year 25. I would say it's not so much a big deal as it was simply hard work by the dedicated DIVA personnel who are to be commended for their work in reclassifying these Medicaid eligibility, as well as assisting with other coverage for those affected. This area also has caseload and utilization charges due to the impact of redeterminations and the driving of costs down with individuals being removed from Medicaid eligibility. There are Medicaid forecast projections that are reviewing this impact of this unwinding process and attempting to determine what, if any, budgetary instability there might occur. It's expected that there will be a normal annual determination process in place after the first quarter of 2025. There's also the buy-in program where the state can use Medicaid dollars to buy into programs for individuals by offering Medicare savings programs for income eligible individuals. There are individuals who would not, these are, indiv in, these are individuals who would not normally sign up for Medicare due to cost. Other items covered under the Medicaid program, global commitment are a net neutral program supported through a waiver investment with matching dollars, which is a safety net for services to the unenrolled, uninsured or underinsured populations. The third area of DIVA's budget, B309. This is the Medicaid program, state only. 
The main takeaway here is that funding within this item is covered by Vermont's portion of what the global commitment funds do not cover. You will notice that this account is nearly 100% funded with general funding. These are paid for through general funding because they are state-only programs or state-only funded and are not federal programs. Second item of note here, again, is the caseload utilization, which I previously described. There's also the buy-in program, allows states to use Medicaid dollars to buy in duly eligible beneficiaries to Medicare and to offer Medicare savings programs for income eligible individuals where these individuals might have otherwise foregone Medicare due to costs. There's also the family planning services. This program was previously paid for by the Vermont Department of Health and these services will now be funded by DIVA. The final portion of DIVA's budget is B310. This is the Medicaid non-waiver matched program. The, this program or area is completely separate. It's not part of the global commitment agreement. It's a different accounting area for state and centers for Medicare and Medicaid services to include matching dollars. The following are items which this, which this portion of the budget supports. The DSH payment program. This is a disproportionate share hospital payment program where um, there are federal funds allocated to states for the purpose of reimbursing hospitals that serve a high proportion of uninsured and Medicaid insured patients. This is a big help for all of our hospitals. The disproportionate share hospital funding is granted to the states through the federal government. States have considerable power to determine the distribution of these funds to hospitals and the amount changes to individual hospitals from year to year. Another item in this area is reviewing the caseload and utilization, and this time it's for the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is health which is health coverage to children and families with low to moderate incomes. Each state has the option to cover its um, children's health insurance program population within its Medicaid program. Current census, focus, uh, current census forecast is reporting that this program's usage is down from last year. There's also the buy-in for the qualifying individual program, which assists elderly individuals in paying their Medicare premiums if they meet certain requirements. This program is also paid completely by the feds. Now we move on to page 61, B342. It's the Vermont Veterans Home, the care and support services. The Vermont Veterans Home is owned and operated and managed by the state of Vermont where the Veterans Administration must recognize and certify that the facility meets all VA standards. The home provides residential and health care services for veterans of Vermont, their spouses, widows, and Gold Star parents. There are three sources of revenue for the home, which are federal funds, special funds, and general funds. Federal funds consist of Medicare, the VA per diem, and VA stipends. Special funds consist of Medicaid, private pay, and commercial insurance. And as we all know, general funds are from the legislature. Over 82.6% of the home's revenue comes from sources other than general funds. Out of all these fundings, over 25, almost 26% goes to food, pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, as well as physician services. Little over 74% is for salaries and, ben and benefits. You will notice that the largest decrease is in personal services. This is due to vacancy savings from open positions 
and continued use of agency staff to fill clinical positions. There's also a decrease in temporary employees employed by the state. Fringe benefits have increased primarily in health insurance. Physician expenses have also increased. And finally, due to some of the savings in position vacancies, those savings have gone toward the hiring of outside staff, such as traveling nurses. And there is an appropriation of $1.5 million to the Department of Veterans Home for the design and renovation of the Brandon and Cardinal units that will soon be um, created. And moving on to page 344. I hope it's 344 because my B section says B344. So anyways, this is the Retired Senior Volunteer Program. The Retired Senior Volunteer Program is requesting a little more than $4,500 for its budget due to inflationary costs. This is really a very small amount considering that this investment helps leverage over nearly 250,000 hours of service by about 1,700 RSVP volunteers to 491 nonprofits throughout Vermont. The state allocation continues to help our projects secure over $500,000 in federal and over 130,000 in local funding. The services provided by the Retired Senior Volunteer Program are estimated to be worth over $5 million back to the citizens of Vermont. And I might add, these, these are older adults that have a wealth of experience, consists of over older adults, and they can share in ways that help improve our communities. It's a special program designed for adults 55 and older to connect and share their talent and experience through volunteering. And now, Madam Speaker, as I conclude my presentation of the budget, I am rationally exuberant <laughs> to, to now yield to the member from Norwich. And thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Newport City yields to the member from Norwich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have the extraordinary privilege of sitting next to Representative Page, and he is very funny, and he keeps me alive in committee, so I appreciate that. I used to think one of the hardest things I could do was be the speaker at a conference where I was the only thing standing between tired and hungry participants and a beautiful buffet of chocolate cake. But I think being 11th in the presentation order of the budget is right up there. So I really want to thank those of you who are hanging in here today because our budget is our value and from our veterans to our children, from our bridges to our health care. There is nothing more important. And in House Appropriations, we have the extraordinary privilege of taking what you send us and trying to fit it into a package that meets the state of Vermont's needs. So thank you for being with us and sitting through this because it's really, really important. Um, I also found that in most of my budget areas, I won't tell you how many there are because you're free to count them instead of playing the video games I see some of you playing. Um, because in most of them, we actually accepted the governor's recommendations. There's not a lot of money change, but there are some big changes. And I do want you to hear about them because they're important and they reflect some of the hard work going on in our communities, in our committees. I'm gonna start by talking about the Department of Children and Families, which is where and how we show up as a state to help the people who really need a, a little bit of safety or a little bit of a helping hand when things don't go well. This is everybody from some of our seniors to our victims of domestic violence to children and to people with disabilities. And we show up for them because they're our neighbors and our communities and we wanna make sure everybody has a fair chance here. So in section B316, which starts on page 34 of the web report and on page 49 of the budget is introduced. We, uh, this represents the commissioner's office, which provides administration and support services for the Department of Children and Families. And a lot of stuff that actually affects other parts of state government or also affects other departments within DCF ends up in this office. We accepted the governor's proposed overall 3.6% increase to 69 million and change. 
But there was a lot going on here, and it's actually instructive for what's going on in state government in general. One lesson of DCF is that if we don't invest in the core operations of our agencies, we actually spend a lot more and we sometimes get a lot less. So one of the first examples is the need for a family services decision, uh, division IT system that is for tracking child welfare and children involved in that system. At stake in this data system, IT system, which sounds pretty boring, is actually the safety of our children but also access to federal funding. So I was incredibly grateful to the hard cross committee and bipartisan effort that turned over every single couch cushion in the, in the building and found enough money to support this new system. If we do this, we did manage to find $6 million. If we do this, we are not only protecting our children, we are also opening the door to additional federal funding that we have been leaving on the table because we did not invest in core, uh, core systems. The language related to this, um, this system shows up in four places. The first is in section, this is all one-time money, is B1100 subsection E2 on page 71 of the RET Web report and page 96 of the budget language that appropriates a total of $3 million. You may wonder where this money came from, which couch cushion it was under. Um, this $3 million is funded by a transfer from the tobacco chins funds, which is found on page 117 of the budget language in d 101 b 1E. On, we had to get more, that wasn't enough. So on page 137 in E 300.5, we appropriate 3 million from the Agency of Human Services from the fiscal year 24 carry forward for this system. You may know there's always carry forward. What we're saying is this system is so important to the safety of our children and to creating future rain, future revenues that we can use to free up general fund dollars that we're going to take some of that carry forward and dedicate it to this. Um, in section E317 on page 158, there is also uh, language from the House Human Services Committee that relates to stakeholder engagement to inform the design and development of the system. It's great to have a system, but if it doesn't capture the information it needs to capture and we can't benefit from that expertise, it won't work the way we want it. So thank you for that language. This, um, this investment, is going to be in 317 in Family Services Division. I'm mentioning it here because it relates to that system, but this year's appropriation also is going to use a carry forward from last year of about $4.7 million. We don't know yet the total cost of this system, but between last year and this year, the committee has figured out how to put together uh, sufficient money when you match it with federal money to, to yield about $22 million. So it's a one-to-one -one match, federal and state funds. That was a huge lift. Super grateful to the committee for doing that work. There's another place that's really exciting here that is very similar. There's a theme. If you don't invest in core operations, you leave money on the table and you don't meet critical needs. So I'm grateful again for a second bipartisan effort. This one was about summer EBT, which is providing meals to kids over the summer when they're not in school and not getting access to school meals. And it started with a base increase in the budget every year in the governor's base. Thank you to the governor for putting that in. That will kick in every year moving forward. Because our IT system is so inadequate, we were not able to access that money in the current year, but we are using money to both seek a waiver from the US Department of Agriculture to allow us to proceed because we are putting money in for future years, and we are appropriating one-time money to be able to support that work and get started with that system. So on page 103 in the budget, we appropriated 500,000 in one-time GF and 500,000 in federal matching funds to support the initial development of this program. And in section E316, on page 157 of the budget as introduced. We also appropriated 40,000 for non-citizen students who participate in that summer EBT as well. This is a really significant uh, investment in food insecurity. It's also really powerful because when we invest in this system, we're not just using state dollars, we're also accessing federal dollars. So we're bringing resources to keep our children well-fed so that they can be healthy and strong. A third significant item that many of you have reached out about was we were able, 
with more looking under couch cushions to put into line B or into B1100E4 on page 72 and on page 96 of the budget, we were able to add 332,000 to extend service hours for the 211 hotline. And if you think about it and you think about when people are often finding they're out in the street and they need access to housing or their heat went off or something terrible happened, it doesn't always conveniently happen during regular work hours. So the goal of this is to make sure people get the help when they need it and not just when it's convenient because it happens to be between nine and five. Because the reality is, if it was between nine and five, you wouldn't need the hotline. So that was a huge lift and really glad to see that work done as well. And on page 156 in sections E3, 16.1, the budget also includes language provided by the administration that cleans up and provides technical corrections relating to the Building Bright Futures Fund. Uh, some more language you may wanna look at in this section on page 136 in section E300.3 um, and on page 137, in section E300.4. These are uh, two pieces of language that I'm associating with and we are putting into this section of the budget because it requires, first, the human service, um, requires the Agency of Human Services to lead on providing the legislature with information on the development of residential beds for youth. These are youth in the DCF system, but we're working with the uh, Agency of Human Services as a whole because it actually crosses divisions within AHS and also requires AHS to convene a stakeholder input process for planning the high-end system of care and temporary stabilization unit for youth that was addressed earlier in the presentation. Um, moving on. The next section in DCF is B317. You can find this on page 34 of the web report and on page 50 of the budget is introduced. Um, in this section, we accepted the governor's proposed overall base increase of about 4.2% to 148 and change million. Um, much of this, uh, you know, in this area, I think I spoke about some of the programs previously that will apply to this division. The other significant new change in this area um, is that in E317.1 on page 159 of the budget is introduced, we added language recommended by the House Human Services Committee that reallocates funds to post-permanency adoption services. That was sort of residual and not applied from last year. And so the, the Human Services Committee is redirecting it. But also there will be residual funds that le are left over and that are enough, and this is very exciting, um, 446,000 for a youth homeless shelter in St. Albans. And this is a program that would provide substantial support for youth who are aging out of DCF custody as well as other human uh, homeless youth. And this is uh, another significant um, investment in keeping people housed in the state of Vermont. Um, and that's a, a population that we need to support them because they may not have adults in their lives who are able to support them as they make that transition. Um, in section B318 at the Department of Children and Families, the next division is the Child Development Division. Page 35 of the web report and on page 50 of the budget as introduced is where you can find their base numbers. And this includes base funding of 237.8 um, million, most of this is for child care subsidies. The House Appropriations Committee accepted the governor's proposed overall base increase. It's about 115%. And this reflects the success and the phasing in of the child care bill that was passed last year in Act 76. In the web report and on page 50 of the budget, in section B318, the House Appropriation Committee also took the House Human Services recommendation to restore $9 million in base funding for CFAP subsidies that are provided in this. The governor had cut this from his proposed budget, saying that they weren't needed. Um, the concern is, if the money is not there, that eligible families potentially would be, apply and be denied service. So by restoring this, we're guaranteeing that no eligible family is denied service or denied access to this child care subsidy. Um, this concern about exactly how much is this is going to cost, it's obviously unstable when you're in the initial years of implementation. But to make sure that this is not an issue going forward, the House Human Services Committee also recommended language on E318 on page 159 that requires the administration 
to collaborate with the General Assembly and you know, in, on, on a report to come up with a consensus cost projection so we're not arguing about the numbers and what the actual cost of this is. Um, in addition, on page 102 of the budget is introduced, we accept the governor's reversion of $10 million that was appropriated last year for childcare that could not be spent last year, but that is coming back in this budget to help support uh, critical activities. In this division also on page 160, you can see sections 318.1 and 318.2 for House Human Services recommended language on child care tuition rates. This language looks repetitive, it's not, and it needs one technical correction that I'll tell you about. The purpose of this is there are some child cares that had initially very low tuition, and with the new subsidies, the idea is to help them have a year to catch up before we start limiting or capping the rate of increase of that tuition. So this language is appears twice to strike out the cap from last year, and then it comes back again, and the uh, technical amendment that our chair will explain reimposes the cap at the end of the year. That gives them a chance to, to get to a place where they can be sustainable. In the next budget section, on page 319, this is the Office of Child Support. You can see this on page 35 of the web report and on page 51 of the governor's budget is introduced. We accepted the governor's recommended increase of about 5%, and I'm not gonna talk about that because pretty much it's straightforward. Similarly, on page, um, in section B320, which is aid to age blind and disabled, page 35 of the web report, and on page 51 of the budget is introduced, we accepted the governor's recommended decrease of about three and a half percent, and that uh, resulted in a recommend, oops, I have a little typo here, a you know, I do, a recommendation of about almost 13 million. Uh, we asked about the reductions here, and the administration said it reflected shrinking caseloads. This is actually related to something that will come up later, um, and there's some question about whether uh, this is this is a, a federal supplement to recipients of the federal SSI program, or over 65, and there's some question about whether this particular categorization is really capturing the full population of people with disabilities for whom we might need to provide some support. And you'll hear about more work from the House Human Services Committee on that in coming, coming months. Um, gonna keep moving here. On page three, uh, in section B321, this is the general assistance program. This is the program that has been in the news quite a bit this fall. On page 36 of the web report and on page 52 of the budget is introduced. You'll notice that we accepted the governor's recommended increase of about 7%, which results in a base recommendation for the general assistance program of about $11 million. This is the pr main program that we think of when we think about emergency housing. This budget section um, it also includes an 839,000 uh, increase for security for hotels. In addition to that base appropriation for this program, the governor is also recommending a one-time increase of 16.5 million in section B110E1, which shows up on page 71 of the web report and on page 96 of the budget is introduced. This brings the total funding in this line, in this program, one time plus base, to about $27.5 million in fiscal year 25. In B1100, E3 on page 72 of the web report and on page 96 of the budget, You'll also see that there's an extension of 10 limited service programs. Um, this was recommended from the governor to continue to support this program. That's included. There was some concern, uh, in fact, there was significant concern about whether that appropriation was enough to actual, actually meet needs. And um, as uh, referred to earlier by the rep from Middlebury, on page 100 in B1102A1, on page 100 of the budget, as introduced, you'll see reference to the use of contingent funds that will be made available at the close of fiscal year 24 to appropriate an additional 20 million to the GA program. And we are confident at this point, based on current revenues, that this will be available. And the goal is to buy as much time as we can until adequate shelter capacity addressed in this bill, but also addressed in some of the bills that will be coming before us in the next couple of days um, exists. 
on page 160 in section E321, in language recommended by the House Human Services Committee, we propose language for temporary emergency housing. You will remember that in every BAA, we've been talking about this program, talking about who will be sheltered and, and what it will look like. What the Human Services Committee is trying to do is to stabilize that. So we're not coming back and having different conversations about different populations every year so that we can have consistent, coherent policy that we can build budgets and we can build staff and we can build operations around. This language in the budget aligns with um, the current year's work, what we're proposing in the budget, with what is coming to you in H879, which is also coming to the floor. And what it does is it, it provides consistency and predictability about how this program will operate. Um, it also ties the number of days for which people are eligible to the uh, statewide vacancy rates, and it specifies and clarifies what populations are going to be protected. And this includes our elderly, some of our, our student, our individuals with disabilities and families with young children. We've heard terrible stories about people with medical events, and this is trying to um, clarify that and also clarify how we identify people who need to be in this program, since it's pretty clear that previous definitions of disability were not doing the job. Um, the next section I want to address is B322, the Three Squares program. This is a federal program. I referred to exciting work earlier in the context of 316. There's no increase in this area financially, but on page 166 in, action, in section E322, the House Human Services Committee also recommended language that requires the administration to submit a plan on the cost and process of transitioning to recalculate three squares benefits at a higher level. We've heard that that size of that benefit is not adequate. It has not kept pace with the cost of, of food in the state of Vermont. And this is a really critical first step towards making sure we recalculate that benefit and access dollars to make sure people can actually uh, take care of needs on that, on that benefit. Uh, on, in the next section is B323. This is the reach up program. Uh, on page 36 of the web report and on page 52 of the budget, you'll find the details, including a total expenditure of about 37.2 million in base funding, most of it from the general fund, but other, uh, other funding sources as well. We did accept the budget as proposed by the governor for this year. This is a program that is grossly underfunded. It has been underfunded for quite a long time. And when you think about the general assistance program, this particular program, and the next program I'm going to talk about, or, or the you know the HOP program altogether, underfunding in these programs tends to just squeeze need across different budgets within DCF. And I'm incredibly grateful to the Human Services um, Committee for noting that persistent and significant underfunding in this area may be contributing to growth and dependence in other budget lines, including those the GA program. So significantly, the estimated housing cost basis for calculating the benefits for reach up is the cost of housing in 2001. Let me say that again. We are estimating how much of a benefit people need to help take care of themselves and get housing based on what it costs to rent an apartment in 2001. So the Human Services Committee on page 167 in section E323 added, um, uh, we added language that requires DCF to redo their report to recalculate the needed benefits based on realistic cost estimates so that we can make uh, progress on bringing benefits to where they need to be, but to do it in a data-informed way. The next section of the budget is B324 at the Department of Children and Families. We accepted the governor's recommendation here, um, and you'll see that these are mostly special funds and federal funds. On page 167 of the budget, as proposed, in section E324, there's some governor-recommended language to help expedite the fuel benefits to ensure people don't run out of fuel. So you want to get the money quickly so you can stay warm and not two weeks later. Um, the next budget section is B325, the Office of Economic Opportunity. You'll find this on page 370 of the web report and on page 53 of the budget as introduced. This uh, line, this section includes about 3.30, I'm sorry, 36.4 million in base funding. This is a significant increase over last year, about 28% up 
in the governor's recommend, and it's mostly general fund. Again, you need to think about this program. This includes the HOP program, which provides grants for everything from housing to funerals, and it's very flexible, and it uh, also supports some of the, the shelters that we've been trying to build and, and set up. And this works together with those other two funds that I previously mentioned. Um, we accepted the governor's proposed increase of over just over seven million in base funding to support shelter bed expansion. And on page 167 in the proposed budget in section E325, there's language that directs DCF to use the total of just, a, just under 26 million here in the HOP program to issue grants to community agencies assisting people who are unhoused. Um, so again, think of this as a complement to the GA. You'll notice an emphasis on shelter, and um, this reflects the transition that the House Human Services Committee has been working to make in recent years. In the next section, which is B326, uh, this is the section related to weatherization. Page 37 of the web report and on page 54 of the, of the budget is introduced, show that we spend about uh, you know 15.8 million in base funding, all of it in special federal funds. On page 168 in section E326, you'll see new language that also specifies that 750,000 of this appropriation can be used to help fund um, replacement uh, equipment or repair of home heating equipment um, to make sure, again, people can stay warm when it's needed. Um, it also includes language that increases the assistance amounts and directs landlords to account for energy cost reductions when entering into uh, rate stabilization agreements. Um, and a fun fact in this area is that 1,139 households were uh, helped to weatherize in fiscal year 23. Um, moving on to the next section, B327. This is the uh, budget area for the Secure Residential Treatment Program. We um, This occurs on page 37 of the web report, and page 54 of the budget is introduced. It, uh, it is a total of almost $4 million in base funding. It's slightly down from last year because you'll recall, as mentioned earlier, this uh, facility is not operating because it's under development. And um, it is also in carrying along in this budget uh, additional resources to help support the development of that uh, proposed high-end system of care. All right. The next budget area you can um, is the DCF Department of Disability Services. This is B328. It's on page 38 of the web report, and on page 54 of the budget is introduced. And we accepted the governor's recommend in this area as well. Page uh, on page 44 of the web report and page 63 of the budget as introduced, you'll find a different office. This is B36, the Office of the Child Youth and Family Advocate. Uh, I have to give a shout out to their incredible work this year. They actually helped us identify the challenge and risk associated with the lack of a robust uh, child welfare system at DCF, but they also showed us what some of the positive benefits would be of trying to uh, invest in putting that system online. So huge thanks to them. We would have liked to increase them, but due to lack of resources, we accepted the governor's recommended budget in this area. All right, you still with me? Next up are what our chair calls the Arts and Humanities for 100, because the next cluster of budgets all deal with the creative arts, and that small amount of about $100,000 is enough to make these tiny agencies that punch above their weight, they're absolute giants in the Vermont economy, and they're absolute giants in our culture, but they, don't, they, they operate on a shoestring. So the first one is the Vermont Council of the Arts. The Vermont Arts Council, it's on B808. And on page 59 of the web report and page 82 of the budget as it introduced, you'll see that we added 50,000 to the governor's recommended uh, budget to fund the entire one-to-one -one match for the anticipated NEA award. And just to give you a sense, this, is a, this group has partnered with the Vermont Humanities and they've done incredible work, not just with the, the arts communities that you think you're, you're familiar with, but also to help people in the wake of the flooding recently and, and help people and arts groups think about flood sustainability as well. 
The next line item is B809. And if you happen to hear the most extraordinary cello music emanating from the room downstairs, that would be the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, which uh, treated to us to a sample of their music. On page 59 of the web report and page 82 of the budget is introduced, we accepted um, their budget as recommended by the governor. And we also encourage you to go find one of their concerts all over the state. They do a fabulous job of making sure that they have a footprint in every single, uh, every single um, uh, county. The next one is the Vermont Historical Society. You'll find this on page 59 of the web report and page 82 of the budget as introduced. You may have noticed that they were closed for a significant por portion of the year. They occupy the Vermont Historical Museum, which was flooded last summer. One side effect of that, and it's also aggravated by other offices moving out, their fee for service costs increased significantly. Unfortunately, that increase was not reflected in the governor's proposed budget. I like to think of them as a wildebeest. They are part public and part private, which means they bear the responsibilities of both, but not the benefits of either. They really need help. If we don't cover the gap between what the governor recommended and what they need, they will not be able to afford uh, just to keep that place open. So we added an additional 43,000 to bring them up and make them whole on their fee for space. Um, and then the last section in my budget is the Vermont Humanities Council. This is on page 60 of the web report and page 83 of the budget as introduced. And we accepted the governor's proposed budget, which was a 3% increase in base um, to 309,000 in fiscal year 25. So with that, thank you so much, Madam Speaker. And I yield the floor to the Dean of Fish Hatcheries, the representative from Colchester. The member from Norwich yields to the member from Colchester. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, you'll be happy to know uh, I am going last, uh, and I've trimmed down my remarks to just a hair under 30 minutes. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I'll, st I'll start off with section B124. It's uh, the governor's office, and there's not very much exciting going on here, and I mean that strictly in a monetary way. There's uh, a slight up of $100,000, it's personnel, uh, personal services and internal service transfers. Uh, the next section is B129, the Lieutenant Governor's Office. That's on page 18. And that's up a uh, meager 20,000, a little under $20,000, personal services, fee for space, and insurance. Uh, moving on to Fish and Wildlife, B702 is on, you'll find that on page 75. Uh, in that, we uh, increase the governor's recommend by $550,000, and that is uh, primarily funds the uh, Salisbury Fish Hatchery for this coming year in, in the hopes that we uh, come up with a fix in the future for that facility. Um, it also funds in this bill is a, uh, a position for a game warden, which will uh, be devoted to animal cruelty work. Um, moving on to transportation, you've heard the transportation bill uh, reported last week and pass it in this body. So I'm, I'm going to spare you the whole bill and just go over the changes we have made in house appropriations. Uh, first uh, change can be found on page 62, B905. That's maintenance, where we reduced maintenance by $2 million. And uh, use that uh, increase in the T fund to fund another $860,000 in town highway aid, a 1 million in town highway structures, and also um, the remainder of that $140,000 will go to uh, the e-bike program you'll find in one time of monies. Page 63 is section 906. This can get a little complicated. It's uh, it's a transfer of $1.7 million from the um, public transit appropriation, which was to be used, it's, it's out of 4 million overall, and it was to be used for e-sprinter vans. And um, that transfer will go to um, the Environmental Policy and Sustainability 
section. That's step two of the process. Step three is environmental policy and sustainability uses that 1.7 in step two to, uh, for the electrification of central garage. And that will be buying electric vehicles for central garage. Freeing up that money in central garage, then um, we use that uh, 1.7 from central garage. And we put that into the T fund as a one-time appropriation to fund the um, items I just uh, listed earlier, 860, 1 million and $140,000. One-time monies, this one time, this 1.7 that we just freed up ends up in um, for uh, level one and two charging ports in B1100, that's found on page 96, B1100J1. And the one-time monies in B1100J2 is the $140,000 for electric bikes. DMV, no changes in DMV. Most of the increase is related to benefits, personal services. There is a 1.5 increase in contractual services. And just a reminder, DMV collects an annual $383 million for uh, in funds. So they are, uh, they are our best friend. In the E section on 910, there is a technical correction on Building Bright Futures license plates, uh, merely uh, purely technical. And E915 also is uh, is technical la language, which uh, is related to the two million dollar transfer out of maintenance. Anytime you make a, a technical uh, a correction or a deviate from the formula, you need to you need the language to go with it. And that is all I have. If there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them later. Thank you, and I'll, I'll turn it over to the chair of the committee for closing remarks. The member from Colchester yields to the member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The budget has now come full circle and back to me to report on the most exciting part is the effective dates, which can be found on page 183 of the budget, which is section F100. It's small a takes uh, place on passage, and this is the C section, which is represents the current year budget, which is FY24. S uh, small b uh, takes effect on March 1, 2024, because there's a waiver request that's in process that needs to start on that date. Small c, is three items that actually needs to take place retroactively to July 1, 2023, because of the implications around the uh, garage. There's an allowance of 5% on admin and, uh, and uh, ERAF. Small d in this section is the child care cap, but stay tuned in our amendment, we're going to add another um, section to this, to this uh, child care cap an E325. Small e is because of an of it's taking place on January 1, 2024, because of a name change. And F is all remaining sections take place on July 1, 2024. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank the standing committees again. I do often, but it I mean it for their work. Um, to thank the public for their engagement and the willingness to speak at our public hearings and to thank the witnesses who have testified. A list of who we have heard from can be found on my desk. And I cannot close without thanking the members of the House Appropriation Committee. Without them and their details that you heard on their budgets, we would not be able to present the, the breadth and width of this budget without them. And it, it is not easy to be in the center of funding, and they are amazing. But enormous gratitude is for the staff at our Joint Fiscal Office and our Ledge Council for all of the hours, countless hours, that they put in and work right beside us as they keep this train running. The House Appropriations Committee vote on this bill was eight 
four zero, and we respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. And now speaking for the Committee on Ways and Means, member from Brattleboro. Madam Speaker, your Committee on Ways and Means found a few sections um, in the budget that we thought would be better suited in our miscellaneous tax bill and communicated with the Appropriations Committee about, and we have um, already voted those sections out in our miscellaneous tax bill. I believe that was two days ago, but days are a little confusing at this point. And I believe the Appropriations Committee is offering an amendment to take care of those. And after all that is done, your Committee on Ways and Means voted the budget out favorably on a vote of nine to one. Thank you. Members, there is an amendment printed in the calendar from the member from, from the member from Northfield, Representative Donahue, and it's my understanding that the member will not be offering the amendment. So now the member from Montpelier, Representative Casey and others offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Montpelier. Madam Speaker, this past July, floodwaters rolled into our communities, causing unimaginable devastation. People lost their homes, people lost their livelihoods, people lost their lives. In central Vermont alone, Washington, Lamoille, and Orange County businesses suffered a collective $300 million of economic injury. And this doesn't even come close uh, to representing other regions that were impacted. Owners had only just climbed out of debt with COVID and were once again knocked down, taking on a collective $143 million in debt, again, just in central Vermont alone. We were grateful for the BGAP program, which the administration released this summer, uh, dispersing $20 million to some impacted businesses. But given the toll of the devastation, the dollars were few and the criteria was rigid. Organizations uh, who were rejected included in Washington County, Good Samaritan Haven, who was the glue that held our county together through the GA process and continues to do that. They are a homeless shelter. And the director today described spending hours navigating a confusing and frustrating process, only to be ultimately told at the end, the bank is closed. Hit particularly hard in all of the flood devastation were BIPOC and new American businesses who represented a staggeringly disproportionate $63 million of total economic injury. Madam Speaker, we came into this session requesting millions of dollars to help get our business community out of financial ruin. But we understand the economic realities which is why this amendment asks for no state dollars. What it does do is set up a mechanism to raise federal dollars and any other trees we can shake in the off session and create a structure to distribute these funds equitably. This amendment creates the Flood Recovery Assistant Program, which expands the eligible criteria from only covering physical or structural damages to the flood to lost revenue for businesses, lost wages uh, of employees in the businesses, lost inventory, damaged equipment, and other operating expenses. It also makes sure that in the consideration of this, we, we, we take into account the businesses of persons of color and new Americans who are so horribly affected by this flood. Recovery is a multi-year process. We're not asking for state money this year, but we're asking for hope that there are better days ahead. Here in Montpelier, we love having everybody in this chamber coming to the Capitol every year, and we tried to clean up the best we could for you. But behind every shuttered storefront is a story of heartache. You're never gonna have lunch at the Hippie Chickpea again. You're never gonna make a copy at Capital Copy. You probably haven't had too many dinners at Positive Pie this year. 
And uh, I don't think many of you stayed at the Camp Plaza so far. These businesses are the economic engine of our region, and by helping them, we help our entire state. So I asked myself the question, what is the role of state government if we can't help people who lost everything they had through no fault of their own? This amendment in itself doesn't solve those problems, but it sends a message to business owners that we haven't forgotten them. My favorite author, Oscar Wilde, once said, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Madam Speaker, 34 of us in, in this body sponsored the omnibus flood bill at the beginning of the session, which had nearly identical language to this. And I ask that you support this amendment today because it's pro-business, pro-people, supports economic justice, supports racial justice, and also because it's the right thing to do. Madam Speaker, we're living in dark times, but this gives us a star in the sky to look at and something to achieve. Uh, there's a number of reasons we can always look at why this can't be done, but ACCD has been dispersing similar grants all summer. We're up to the task, and uh, you know we believe it can do a lot of good. So thanks very much. We ask the body support. Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Your House of Appropriations Committee did hear the passionate amendment from, from the members that were sponsoring it, and we are very much aligned with a lot of the feelings and the direction of where that goes. Uh, however, it, at this time and without any other further testimony and feeling not wanting to go around the, the work that's happening within the, the Commerce Committee and others, that this is a much, it's a bigger conversation, something that I do believe that is a larger body and the state needs to have. But to bring it in at the budget at this time uh, is probably not the vehicle and on a, a committee vote of 12 0, 0 we found the amendment uh, unfavorable, and we ask you to not support it. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others? Are you ready for the question? Member from Barry City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just wanted to address this amendment, which my colleagues from Montpelier and Barry have co-sponsored with me. This request is effectively an extension of the Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program, which was designed to alleviate harm to businesses and nonprofits impacted by the summer floods. In effect, it would create a shell of a program with no money attached to offer grants to organizations suffering from physical damages, lost income, revenues, wages, and other costs, as you heard. This was a billion dollar disaster, and our government's initial response was insufficient. I'd like to address some questions that you may be having. Does creating or recreating this program set precedent for responding to future disasters? No. BGAP's creation and impact throughout the summer and fall has already done that. Why wasn't this a committee bill? I suspect some of you will sympathize with me in this. Uh, it was drafted as a committee bill, but no action was taken in commerce because we were told there is no money for it. So <laughs> we went to ask for money for it, and we were told there's no bill. So here we are. Uh, why can't a nonprofit do this work? Believe me when I tell you, some are trying, some have been trying all summer and fall. Some people in this chamber set up nonprofits to distribute grants to businesses, and it wasn't enough. It's not enough. ACCD has the experience and institutional memory and systems implemented this past summer to draw upon, as well as a statewide reach. What funding can be sought? Plenty. Federal Business Disaster Release funds through HUD, FEMA, USDA, and other federal agencies. To summarize, for a $1 billion disaster, more expensive than Tropical Storm Irene, in an $8.5 billion budget, we are spending around $13 million on flood recovery. That is one-tenth of 1% 1 of the state budget. There's that funny feeling again. Ask yourselves, is that enough? Really, is that enough? Are we doing enough here? Ask yourselves, what will my colleagues do for me when my community is drowning? When I stand where Jonathan is standing right now, gasping for air.
This body sees in, in its expressed desire to shop or dine at Montpelier and Berry businesses how dire the need is, how hundreds of businesses across the state and here are hanging on by a thread. We are not asking for money in this amendment. We are not asking you to fill the tin cup that we have extended to you. We were already told no. Instead, we are asking merely for the cup itself to go begging. I hope that you will support us in this amendment. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others, member from Barry City? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I could not uh, add my voice to the request. Again, it's a request to essentially put a marker down for future appropriations, hopefully from the federal government, but maybe not. Maybe there will be some uh, funds in the upcoming fiscal year, not yet realized, and hopefully they will be federal money. But the point is, as my uh, seatmate from Barry City has articulated, this was unprecedented. It uh, actually overshadowed Irene. And in terms of the uh, amount of effort uh, to repair around the state, not just Barry and Montpelier, is really quite small relative to the effort of Irene. And I realize, uh, working on ways and means, this biennium, that, that money is tight. And we have several problems, but we didn't pick the summer floods. Uh, frankly, all of us have been warned that this kind of surprise weather is due. We just didn't know when. Uh, we don't get to pick, if you will, when disasters strike. Uh, all we can do is imagine uh, the, the best for our fellow citizens. So I do ask that you seriously consider the amendment as presented. I am, uh, regret the fact that appropriations uh, didn't go a little further with us, but nevertheless, that's where we are. Thank you very much. Member from St. Albans City. Madam Speaker, it's really hard when very worthy amendments to the budget are presented, very worthy ideas are presented in floor amendments to the budget. It's very hard to listen to the idea that we can't do one thing or we can't do another. I wanna stand up here and say that the process really matters. The process can be really frustrating but it really matters how we arrive at the decisions about what to include and not include in the budget. The committee process, especially the appropriations committee in a year like this, where I think many of us would rather there have been some language or some dollars for one priority of ours or another. But I think it's imperative that at times like this, that we look across the entire budget and all of the things that it supports and support the work of the committee. Um, it's hard to do that sometimes and I really do that and I respect the passion and the commitment that the folks presenting this amendment are bringing. But we all need to come together and support the process in this and on because of that I'm going to vote no on this amendment. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others, member from Virgens? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I know that we heard this just a few hours ago, um, but I just want to remind, I know the, that what we have been able to do from this body in the BAA, we uh, uh, made a tough call of the resources we had to make sure that we put $10 million of general fund to direct grants and uh, support through um, some, both to split between FEMA and, and direct grants to the communities because they needed it desperately to be able to stay alive. And I believe that this body did react to that. And, um, and as a result, it was, a, it was a, a, not an easy task, but a worthy one to do and to find uh, $15 million to have to close FY25 before we could even think about any other additions. So yes, it is, it is a tough call. 
And in this budget here, we do have a, a taking into consideration some of the other further needs within the communities and towns that have homes that need to be raised because of their situation dealing with the flood and now the cost of raising it. We, we actually have in this budget on the contingency list $3.5 million for that purpose. But we heard this morning, not just, I, I welcome the fact that it didn't cost money today, but this policy development that's on page 2812 and 2813 instructs the Agency of Commerce and Community Development shall establish the Flood Recovery Assistance Program to provide financial assistance in the form of grants, not loans, grants. We didn't even do grants in Irene, to nonprofits and nonprofit businesses in the state that suffered losses due to the 2023 flood. Nothing beyond that, very specific, not a bad thing, policy that is probably not the place to bring in at that level uh, a couple hours before we're bringing the budget we've been working on since January in. Um, I do believe that it would be a worthy cause in the future to have a conversation about the fact that this is not the end of where climate change is going to be pinching us. There's $100 million in match money for FEMA. Just imagine what we in this body would have done if we didn't have to put out $100 million, or maybe a little less, of dollars in FEMA match in response to what happened that the state needs to support within. It's going to happen again and maybe again, and I do believe that as a whole, we need to figure out how would we like to structure a way to address it for everyone. And um, we, from Appropriations Committee and myself, uh, would look for you to vote no, not because it's against that particular cause, but because this this is our committee and others really want to and should have opportunity to develop the full picture. Thank you. Member from Bradford. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this amendment. We started this session with strong language that established a goal of sending help to communities throughout Vermont that are still reeling from last year's catastrophic floods. If we reject an amendment that has no money attached to it, one that simply creates a framework to help ease the suffering of small businesses across Vermont, we are sending a clear message that we, re we refuse to even acknowledge their pain, let alone help them. These are critical revenue raisers for our state, and they deserve so much more from this body right now. I hope my colleagues will join me in voting yes on this amendment, and when the vote is taken, I request that it is taken by roll. The member from Bradford requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll. Is the member sustained? The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others? A member from Brattleboro. Madam Speaker, I want to share with the body uh, some of the conversation that we had in appropriations this morning that came uh, from, in part, from testimony offered by the commissioner of the Department of Economic Development. Uh, and as you know from my floor speech, this is the area of the budget, one of the areas of the budget that I have responsibility for. And specifically, I'm thinking about going back to testimony that we received from the commissioner about the BGAP program, which did exist and did push money out the door, and about the staffing ramifications for what they're currently experiencing in the agency around that program. So uh, go back a little bit. There were some other programs that were created during the pandemic for business relief that we pushed a fair substantial amount of money out the door in grants. Uh, we authorized seven limited service positions to be a part of the uh, both of the dispersal of that money and then also the crucial accountability for the follow-up on that money, both for, you know, especially for the federal money, but also for state dollars. That's part of our grant making process to be responsible for all stages of the grant making process, including the follow-up. In February, five of those positions were vacant. They have not been able to hire them. They are not yet able to come up with a full plan 
for how they're going to do the follow-up evaluation work for the 500 BGAP grants that have already been given. And that, to me, has, is the reason why that goes beyond just the fact that there is no money, why your appropriations committee was not ready to simply sign on to this amendment. It's not that we are cold-hearted. It's not that we think that there isn't merit to this conversation, but it is our responsibility as an appropriations committee to try to hold to the bigger picture of what is going on and what we might create uh, in unintended consequences. There is room for this conversation to continue to unfold. It is not in the budget, in our opinion. And part of that has to be to grapple with the consequences of the money that has already been pushed out the door, how we're going to address that, how the administration is going to address that. I asked the commissioner, I said, what will you do if you can't hire those extra positions? And the response was, well, I will roll up my sleeve and the deputy and I will help with that. We are already at capacity within this system. And so we have to look systemically before we take this kind of action. So even though there isn't any money, it does have real consequences. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, may I please interrogate the member from Barry City, Representative Williams? Uh, the member from Barry City is interrogated if he so chooses. I do. Thank you. Madam Speaker, we're asked to consider this as a process issue. And I guess I just need a little more clarification or maybe a restatement of the processes by which you've already attempted to create this vehicle. Yes. So as the member from Montpelier described, the uh, bulk of the language in this amendment was originally uh, contained within the flood uh, recovery omnibus bill, which is an environment and energy on the wall. That bill was designed from the outset to be broken into smaller legislative vehicles, many of which have through the BAA and through various Senate uh, bills are making their way here right now. But um, we had requested initially, uh, uh, after that bill was introduced, that uh, the language pertaining to the BGAP extension or FRAP uh, be taken up uh, as a committee bill in House Commerce, but uh, I was informed, uh, regrettably, as the original bill asked for $40 million, we are not asking for $40 million here, we're asking for no money here, um, that there was no money in the FY25 budget. I deeply sympathize with my colleagues from appropriations. They have an, an, an impossible task to find and resource all of our different initiatives and programs. However, uh, we then went to appropriations and sought to see if there was any monies available, be it through uh, ARPA reversions or any other funds, uh, and we were told no. And by that time, uh, crossover had happened, the bill had been drafted as a Commerce Committee bill and unfortunately uh, did not make it across the finish line for crossover. And so we are here now. Thank you, member. Madam Speaker, my interpretation here is that this is the process. This is precisely the process. That, and, and this is not the first time I've seen these requests try different avenues um, for creation. Um, to me, this feels like a legitimate request, and I will be voting yes in favor of this amendment. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others, member from Callis? Madam Chair, it was painful and with great reluctance that I voted no this morning on this because the issue is so obviously positive and because of the colleagues who proposed it. And I just want to say pointedly why I voted no. First of all, I voted no because I think probably ACCD is the wrong agency. I don't think they're going to do anything. They're overwhelmed and nothing is going to happen. It's going to be a useless act. Now, I could be wrong. And I would look to the Commerce Committee, whose chair, we, we, we always hear from the committee. What's the committee's position on this? We heard nothing from the committee this morning. So we don't know. I mean, apparently, and I take it at face value, the committee 
told, or the committee chair or the committee told the sponsors there's no money when they were asking for 40 million, fine. What I would like to know, and we don't know, is this the right agency even if it's, as well put, the empty cup? I don't know if it's the right agency. I tend to think it isn't. That, the, the, in, our, in my view, that's what happens when we try to make these things happen at the very end, quickly, and through the budget, and I don't think it's a good idea in this case. Thank you. Member from Montpelier. Um, Madam Speaker, my colleagues are regular visitors this time of year to our quaint little city. And what you see are businesses open and ready to serve. And what you don't see is their intense struggle to keep the doors open and the lights on. Our small business owners were at the mercy of our amazing volunteers this summer. They begged and borrowed to pull together the cash and human power to strip the floors down to the studs and rebuild. The amount they suffered in lost revenues is staggering. FRAP aims at helping our small business owners close the gap from lost revenues and expenses incurred in building back. We have a responsibility to help our small businesses recover from the devastating effects of last year's flood. And I respectfully ask for the body's support of this amendment. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others member from Montpelier? Uh, Madam Speaker, it's been raised that staff capacity at ACCD might be a legitimate reason to vote this amendment down. And I would argue, if we are successful, and raising millions of dollars in the off session, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if we came back in January and asked for more positions to move all this money out the door? A uh, member from Brandon. Madam Speaker, we don't do our best work rushing these type of amendments through the, through the finish line at the very last minute. But I do wanna say that my heart breaks for the, the communities in central Vermont um, and all over Vermont, in, including some in Rutland County that suffered this past um, summer. Flooding has caused so much problems. Um, we used $20 million in that BGAP fund using broadband money, which had to be replaced. We need, I think what we need to do is look across our committees and work together. We need to work with um, the folks in the administration who are helping with the flood relief and, and looking at those at those dollars and uh, so that we can have improved recovery and resilience for the future. We need to reduce our risk and reduce the costs and we need to look equitably across our committees to provide assistance statewide and work together with all the committees. So I will be voting against the amendment, but um, I do have sympathy. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others? Are you ready for the question? If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrews of Westford. No. Two minutes.
Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats? Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of an electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during a roll call. And when the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so the clerk can accurately record your vote. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Montpelier and others? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Andriano of Orwell. Anthony of Berry City. Harrison of Wethersfield. Arsenault of Williston. Austin of Colchester. Bartholomew of Heartland. Bartley of Fairfax. Beck of St. Johnsbury. Rebecca of Winooski. Byron of Virgens. Black of Essex. Bloomley of Burlington. Bongarts of Manchester. Boslin of Westminster. Yes. Boyden of Cambridge. Yes. Brady of Williston. Brannigan of Georgia. Brennan of Colchester. Brown of Richmond. Brownell of Pownell. Yes. Brumstead of Shelburne. Burdett of West Rutland. No. Brick of Brattleboro. Yes. Burroughs of West Windsor. No. Bus of Woodstock. I'm sorry, Bus of Woodstock. Yes. Thank you. Campbell of St. Johnsbury. Canfield of Fairhaven, Carpenter of Hyde Park, Carol Bennington, yeah. Casey of Montpelier, yes. Chapin of East Montpelier, Chase of Chester, yeah. Chase of Colchester, no. Chestnut Tandrum in Middletown Springs, no. Christie of Hartford, Gina of Burlington, yes, explanation. Clifford of Rutland City, no. Coffee of Guilford, Cole of Hartford, yes. Conlon of Cornwall, no. Corcoran of Bennington, no. Cordes of Lincoln, no. Damar of Enosburg, no. Demereau of Corinth, no. Dickinson of St. Albans Town, no. Dodge of Essex, Dolan of Essex Junction, no. Dolan of Waitsfield, no. Donnie of Northfield, yes. Durfee of Shaftesbury, Elder of Starksboro, Emmons of Springfield, no. Barlice Rubio of Barnet, yes. Galfetti of Barrytown, yes. Garifano of Essex, no. Goldman of Rockingham, no. Ghostland of Northfield, no. Graham of Williamstown, Granning of Jericho, Gregoire of Fairfield, yes. Hango of Berkshire, Harrison of Chittenden. No. Hedrick of Burlington. Yes. Higley of Lowell. No. Holcomb of Norwich. No. Hooper of Randolph. Yes. Hooper of Burlington. Hooper of Burlington. Hooper of Burlington. Houghton of Essex Junction. No. Howard of Rutland City. Hyman of South Burlington. No. James of Manchester. No. Jerome of Brandon. No. Kornheiser of Brattleboro. No. Krasnow of South Burlington. No. Labor of Morgan. No. Labonte of Linden. Yes. Lally of Shelburne. No. Lalonde of South Burlington. No. Lamont of Morristown. No. Lanfer of Regens. La Rush of Franklin, Lubbock of Grand Isle, yes. Lipsky of Stowe, no. Logan of Burlington, Long of Newfane, no. McGuire of Rutland City, Marcotte of Coventry, no. Maslin of Thetford, no. Matos of Milton, no. 
McCann of Montpelier. Yes. McCarthy of St. Albans City. No. McCoy of Pulteney. No. McFawn of Berrytown. Yes. McGill of Bridport. No. Mahali of Callis. No. Minnie of South Burlington. Yes. Morgan of Milton. Yes. Morris of Springfield. Yes. Morrissey of Bennington. Rowicki of Putney. No. Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington. Nicole of Lovelow. Yes. Not of Rutland City. No. Noise of Wolkett. No. Nugent of South Burlington. No. O'Brien of Tunbridge. No. Odie of Burlington. No. Oliver of Sheldon. No. Page of Newport City. No. Payala of Londonderry. No. Parsons of Newberry. No. Pat of Worcester. Pearl of Danville, yes. Peterson of Clarendon, oh. Pouch of Hinesburg, no. Priestley of Bradford, yes. Quimby of Linden, no. Rachelson of Burlington, yes. I'm sorry, Rachelson of Burlington, thank you, Rice of Dorset, Rice of Dorset, no. Roberts of Halifax, yes. Samus of Castleton, Sackowitz of Randolph, no. Shia Middlebury, Shaw of Pittsford, Sheldon of Middlebury, no. Sibylia of Dover, yes. Sims of Crassbury, yes. Small of Anuski, yes. Smith of Derby, no. Squirrel of Underhill, no. Stebbins of Burlington, no. Stevens of Waterbury, no. Stone of Burlington, Supernon of Barnard, Taylor of Milton, yes. Taylor of Colchester, Templeman of Brownington. Yes. Salino of Brattleboro. No. Chief of St. Almond's Town. No. Tory of Moortown. Triana of Standard. No. Walker of Swanton. Yes. Waters Evans of Charlotte. No. White of Bethel. No. Women of Bennington. No. Williams of Berry City. Yes. Yes. Williams of Granby. Yes. Wood of Waterbury. Intriano of Orwell, Carpenter of Hyde Park, Chief in East Montpelier, Christie of Hartford, Elder of Starksboro, Logan of Burlington, Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington, Sam of Castleton, Stone of Burlington, Supernaut of Barnard, For purpose of explanation, member from Westford. I vote no with regret and apologies to my, my colleagues from flood ravaged communities and with my commitment to work with them to create a process and a funding mechanism for now and for all the future disasters we know will happen. Member from Middletown Springs. Madam Speaker, I'm very sympathetic to the pain at the heart of this amendment. The appeal is powerful, but when we act on the fly, we make mistakes. When we don't take the time or testimony to understand the full impact of our actions, we act rashly and set bad precedent. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, according to climate scientists, the flood disasters of 2023 are just the beginning of the great environmental devastation yet to come. I vote yes because the government must be better prepared to serve the people both in the current recovery and in the future times of greatest need. Member from Waitsfield. I got you. Madam Speaker, while I voted no to this amendment, the need to equitably help our communities, businesses, and people now and to become more resilient to the devastation from uh, flooding is real. We need everyone at the table to drive down the risks of tomorrow's floods, the costs and the impacts associated with those floods. Member from Northfield. Madam Speaker, this is exactly the correct process for bringing an issue before the body when it was unable to be heard elsewhere. 
I vote yes in support of the process. Member from Coventry. Madam Speaker, I have been clear that without money to fund this proposal, we are giving our struggling businesses false hope that we will provide them with more help. Member from Newberry. I wish I could have supported this today. I, I truly do. Um, unfortunately, this amendment it requires that um, grants be prioritized by somebody's skin color. This country's been down that road before. It was, it was wrong then and it's wrong now. Member from Middlebury. Well, I believe we can all empathize and agree that the floods of this past year were extremely painful for many. This needs to be part of a larger conversation so that any program that's created is the best one it can be. This will not be the only climate event. Member from Burlington. I vote no, not because this isn't needed, but because statute needs vetting. That is our collective duty. However, we have four more weeks. We must heed this cry for help. We must do more and with better process. Member from Waterbury. Madam Speaker, as a representative of a community damaged by the flooding in July and in December, I must regretfully vote no. The intent of this amendment is important and with a full hearing would be an important addition to our governmental responses to the effects of climate change. I vote no on process, not on the need and intent to get it right. Member from Barry City. I vote yes with sincere gratitude and love to my colleagues. Your sympathy and compassion sustains and inspires me every day. What sustains Barry? Member from Waterbury. Um, Madam Speaker, representing communities that have been through similar devastation, I reluctantly vote no, but I hope that we can find an avenue to address this need. Member from Hartford. Madam Speaker, may I vote? You may. Christy of Hartford. No. Member from East Montpelier. Madam Speaker, may I vote? You may. Chapin of East Montpelier. Yes. Member from West Windsor. Madam Speaker, may I change my vote? You may. Burroughs of West Windsor. Yes. Member from Lincoln. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Having felt the pain of my constituents in a very deep way for a long period of time, um, pain over the failures of parts of our state government to help them during the pandemic. I don't want to set up that situation again with another agency, and that's why I voted no. Member from Granby. Madam Speaker, may I change my vote? You may. Williams of Granby. No. Member from Morristown. Madam Speaker, may I change my vote? So did you say explain or change? Change. You may. Lamont, Morristown. Yes. Member from Essex. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Thank you. After spending the summer gathering donations and coming to dig out businesses and homes that had been flooded, it is difficult to vote no. My commitment is with our neighbors in the ravaged, flooded areas. We will continue to help through the process.
Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 44. Those voting no, 97. The nays have it, and you have declined to amend the bill. Now the member from Virgins, Rep. Represent Lamfer, offers an amendment to the bill that the first assistant clerk emailed to members at 1219 today. This amendment is also posted on the House Overview webpage and paper copies are available on the main table. Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, like a lot of large bills, after we finish, we think that we've got it all covered and yet we don't always. And there's a few things that pop up that we um, want to make sure that we can correct before we send it over to the Senate. And so the, your House Appropriations heard uh, uh, this uh, kind of technical amendment to, to H. Uh, 888 today with one rather interesting substance of change, which would be from Representative Donahue's uh, amendment that was on the calendar. We heard that this morning in, and heard from other committees and it was favorable. And we included that within our uh, amendment. So if uh, I think you indicated that this was emailed today uh, at 12.19 p.m. The first instance of amendment is necessary language in order to put into, um, to execute the, an order of operations in that area where we, we need to indicate that we bring back carry forward before we appropriate it. And the second instance of amendment is clean up uh, and, and corrects, um, the name, or not the, corrects the name, but cor corrects the way that we indicate the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, we forgot a little word called and in there. The third instance of um, amendment is to correct the amount that aligns with the reserves. And the fourth instance of amendment um, removes this section uh, that is referenced, um, I think, earlier uh, from the chair of the Ways and Means Committee because we took this out of our bill because it's going to be carried in the miscellaneous tax bill. This was a, um, a puck fee. The fifth instance of amendment uh, is where we included the representative, uh, the member from Northfield amendment carried here that assures Vermont will have, will be, when we build this new facility that it's actually will be licensed uh, before it goes into operation. The sixth in instance of amendment uh, is another uh, place where we removed and deleted that section because it included a fee that was being um, not really changed, but it referenced it that's being carried in the miscellaneous tax bill. In the seventh instance of amendment, we have uh, uh, the words, the amount of, by striking out 100 and inserting in lieu 400, because it was our intent all along to make sure that that was indicated as such. The sixth instance of amendment here is, is a strike out of this section, and it was brought to our attention. When you leave it open for a little while, there are things that are discovered later that, um, we inadvertently had carried the amount of the $795,000 from the opiate uh, abatement special fund in two places. We did not, it was not our intent to appropriate that amount twice. And this section uh, realigns that in a way that carries that appropriation forward. If you're concerned, it's, it is carried in B1104. The ninth instance of amendment here is um, standard language. However, this was redrafted to better, for a better placement of an order of operations in the appropriations, and it brings clarity to, the, to um, our work. We actually heard from somebody who was unsure uh, uh, how clear the direction was on this appropriation. And speaking with our, our drafting people, it made sense to um, take that consideration in. And if they were confused, we would not want that to be our intent uh, going forward. <clears throat> the 10th instance of amendment uh, is uh, updates the, uh, the effective dates in order to reflect those changes within the bill. The committee heard this uh, today and on a uh, vote of 12 0, 0 straw vote, we uh, found it favorable and we ask for your support. Thank you.
The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Virgins? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Now the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for that question? Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sorry to jump up again. But this bill is a, a rather large um, uh, investment in all of Vermont, and it actually touches the lives of every Vermonter and in state government. And so I would like to request that when this vote is taken, it be taken by roll. The member from Virgins requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by rolls. The member sustained. The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. Members, the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Dover. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, may I interrogate the uh, presenter of the section that included uh, <clears throat> funding for uh, H-289 and a new biologist? Excuse me, 687 and a new biologist. The member from Underhill is interrogated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, uh, 687 came out of the House Environment and Energy Committee on a vote of 8-3, and it included a public engagement process and $200,000 that was intended to uh, <clears throat> spearhead a publicly coordinated statewide campaign to help Vermonters throughout the state understand how to comply with the various aspects of 687, as well as other potential uh, language that may be coming on flood corridors <coughs> and uh, wetlands and other flood impacted legislation, uh, things that our communities are grappling with. Um, Madam Speaker, I was surprised to learn uh, that that public engagement was taken out and substituted uh, for a biologist that I don't believe our committee heard testimony on. Could we hear about the process for that switch in appropriations? Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, yes, we uh, talked about both these issues. Uh, as far as the public engagement piece, uh, it was felt that in committee discussion that uh, the uh, regional planning commissions already do a lot of this work and we felt that that was something that they would be able to take on without the additional uh, funds. Uh, so we took that out and we put the uh, a request from ANR to provide support around some of the work of the, uh, the legislation for actually three positions for uh, two fish and wildlife individuals and another person, I think, in the water services group. Anyway, so we agreed to uh, add the uh, fish and wildlife biologist. Thank you, member. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, this is my 10th year in this building. Uh, I understand how things happen uh, in this building. It's not always through excellent process. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Member from Barry City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the heels of my good friend from Newport City's descriptor of his posture, <laughs> understatement as it was, I have a descriptor of my own. I am extraordinarily grateful by the work of the Appropriations Committee. I know that it is long, hard choices, unwelcome. Uh, but I do want to thank not only them, but members of this body who came to help us during July and August. Many of you did, and we appreciate that. Uh, the fact that we lost a vote a little, little bit ago is altogether forgiven. Anyway, I hope you will 
uh, vote affirmatively on the proposal as presented. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Standard. Madam Speaker, I have a quick question from the member from Callis uh, regarding his report. The member from Callis is interrogated. Madam Speaker, it had been reported uh, that um, the community schools uh, pilot would be continued uh, to be, uh, will, will continue to be funded with a million dollars from the general fund. My question is, um, will all three, my understanding was that there were three schools that received a, one grant each um, from that pilot. My question is, will all three schools be funded through this million dollars? Madam Speaker, the pilot was a three-year program at $1 million a year. We made the decision and then it expired. Right. So we made the decision, Madam Speaker, to that the program was sufficiently valuable that it should be continued using state funds. And so we appropriated $1 million from the education fund, as well as asking for, and it's in the language, a study which would tell us, hopefully, by the Agency of Education and others, how effective the program is. We did not make any determination as to how the Agency of Education precisely would spend that money. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Williston. Uh, the community schools program, just to clarify a little bit, this is coming out of the education fund, not the general fund. And the original bill that was created in 2021 was for a $10 million pilot over three years. That will be expiring at the end of this year. It's a competitive grant program that the agency is running. Uh, and it's one that we've gotten extensive testimony from the agency and from their accountability partner, the University of Vermont on in house education. Um, quite frankly, it's one of the sort of best uh, programs in terms of us really being able to have a sense of how the money's being used and what's happening. And so our goal, and you're going to hear more about this in the miscellaneous ed bill in a couple days, um, is to, because that money would be ending, is to keep this program, community schools, as a competitive grant program. So there's no guarantee of certainly what schools would apply. I can talk more next week about the five major schools that have been part of the pilot doing really, really incredible wraparound work. Um, <clears throat> So the intention here is to con allow for that to continue as a competitive grant program. So it doesn't necessarily mean all, all million would have to be spent um, and to continue this work of understanding and figuring out, quite frankly, we're pioneering in this case in a good way. We've pioneered perhaps some other things in education <laughs> that we, in a good way, um, in a rural context, what does a community schools model look like? It's an approach to schooling um, to really wrap around students and their families and engage families. And we've gotten some national attention for the amazing work that's happening in Vermont around that in some of our um, highest need, most rural communities. So again, the intention here is to continue that as a competitive grant program and for us to continue to get information about what that looks like. Is it scalable? What ways can we bring different agencies within our state together? What ways can we bring in more federal money towards this work um, and, and deliver the best for our kids, particularly those most in need? The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for the question? Member from Fairfax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I interrogate the presenter of the portion um, discussing housing. The member from Burlington is interrogated. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, when you heard testimony over the $18 million carryover funds, did you hear testimony on what was going, what the expected uh, requests were going to be for this coming fiscal year? Madam Speaker, <clears throat> we heard from um, DHCD on several occasions, it confirmed that there was $18 million left in the VHIP program in general funding. 20 million had been appropriated, 2 million had been committed, and we were told <clears throat> um, uh, via 
email and in conversation that that funding would probably take us through March of 2025. Thank you, member. Um, Madam Speaker, did you hear testimony on what the assumed, um, how much a million dollars would uh, create in a unit, um, in units? I can rephrase that. There, there, <clears throat> uh, there uh, we, <laughs> We did hear testimony about uh, the number of units they had actually produced and estimated what they would be producing. That is not information I have with me right now. I thank the member. Thank you. Oh. Madam Speaker, I am absolutely disheartened to hear that this budget doesn't fully fund the governor's request for six million dollars for the vermont housing improvement plan program along with mer you'll hear later today in the presentation of h829 that the language of the bill actually expands vhip and broadens the usage of the program so not only does this budget ask um, or lack the funds to fully support the program as it is now, um, but we're asking them to do more with less funds. Uh, just last week, the program closed their requests um, for uh, grants, and the request came in from five home ownership centers um, for $22 million. That is four, or four million dollars more than the $18 million carryover. If we consider the $1 million that will be appropriated in H829, that's 19 million. It's not enough. Earlier this session, I sat in a joint hearing where a member of this body asked the governor's administration if they had the stomach to spend $200 million on housing. I'm asking this body today if we have the stomach to spend just $6 million. Because I do agree, our budget is our values, but this budget is missing funding for essential housing programs. And by default, this budget does not represent my values or the values of my constituents that have elected me to serve. And that is why I will not be voting in favor of this budget. So the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for the question? Member from St. Albans Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I inquire from the member from Norwich, please? The member from Norwich is interrogated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this is in reference to section E318.1 on page 160, uh, the child care tuition rates. Um, you mentioned this section removes a provision from last year's child care bill, which set a uh, cap on rates at 1.5 times the rate of inflation for education services. Um, this will affect some programs that have low rates. Um, I heard you say that, but what about the programs with higher rates? Is there any provision saying they can't raise their prices? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the language suspends the rate cap for one year and then reinstitutes it. And I'll defer to the chair if she would like to, the member from Waterbury, I'm sorry. The member from Norwich yields to the member from Waterbury. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Norwich is correct. What we learned in this process from the Department for Children and Families is that uh, the institution of the um, maximum amount that a child care provider uh, could raise their rates was causing some issues for those providers that were at historically very low rates. And so um, we are enabling this, uh, this next 12 months to uh, have those folks be able to get up to speed um, with the new program. And so this, as the member from Norwich just said, um, only um, suspends it for one year and then reinstates it next year. Thank you, member. Um, but does that do anything to the programs with the higher rates? 
that have higher rates, I guess? Uh, for the, excuse me, um, Madam Speaker, uh, could the member please repeat the question? <clears throat> yeah, um, so I understand like programs that have the lower rates, but what about ones that have significantly higher rates? Is there any provision saying they can't raise their prices? Uh, uh, is the question uh, during this uh, yes, one yeah. year of suspension? Um, uh, Madam Speaker, the the ability for uh, private businesses to have uh, customers is the primary thing that keeps the rates in check. And so um, we, we did have a situation that we were trying to protect against in terms of any furtherance of it in Vermont. And so that was why we instituted, instituted those provisions in Act 78. Um, uh, so the main thing will be um, those uh, organizations will need to be bound by their need to keep their customers, which are uh, Vermont's families. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm also wondering what um, impact this provision of the budget will have on the sustainability of childcare financing the 0.44% payroll tax, which raises about 100 million and hasn't gone into effect yet. By removing that cap, will we have to increase the payroll tax next year or will the benefit or will that um, benefit the families uh, receiving subsidies be eliminated by higher rates? Uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, there, there's this is not gonna have an impact on the uh, child care contribution that it will be collected, it will not have an, it will not have a negative impact on the industry or families. Um, thank you. Is there is there a fiscal note associated with this policy change? With that specific item? Uh, yeah, by crossing out that by by taking that out for one year. Is there any fiscal note on what this could do to change uh, the policy? No. Okay. Well, thank you, member. Um, Madam Speaker, I am worried that removing this provision may result in making childcare less affordable for taxpayers and Vermonters receiving the subsidy. Um, and I, I'm going to now speak on the bill itself. Madam Speaker, I just want to start off by saying I do appreciate the hard work our House Committee on Appropriations did on this year's budget. I acknowledge that this budget does spend roughly the same amount um, as the governor's recommend and that this budget doesn't rely on any new taxes, but this budget is a shell of the governor's recommend. This budget barely keeps the lights on and many of his initiatives are either eliminated or reduced. As the member from Fairfax note, uh, noted, Vermont's Housing Improvement Program or VHIP has drastically reduced to one six its recommend. This program is one of the most effective programs the state has to offer to get housing units online the quickest and in the most cost effective way. For one-tenth the cost of other housing programs, VHIP uh, can get housing units in un, uh, get housing use units up in under 100 days, units we so desperately need. Vermont's manufactured home improvement and repair program is also cut in half and ahead has been completely eliminated. This budget also irresponsibly burdens future legislators by cutting $5 million out of the IIJA state, ma state match money, which will have to be replaced. Madam Speaker, this House budget walks away from our commitment to substance use prevention funding, shorting, and existing commitment to local prevention efforts and creating a significant destabilization of a system initiated in fiscal year 23 at a time when we all agree that substance use disorder remains an epidemic and Vermonters continue to die due to overdoses. This budget expands eligibility for the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program, but does not um, fund the expansion. Instead, it funds expansion with $20 million of contingent surplus money, which may or may not be available. Simultaneously expanding eligibility while not adequately funding this critical safety net program sets up a fiscally irresponsible precedent. Madam Speaker, I will have a hard time justifying supporting a bill that doesn't address many of the initiatives or concerns my constituents continually reach out to me to discuss. Housing is the most important crisis facing our state that can and will, will solve our problems at the education fund, building our workforce and helping people experiencing homelessness. I will not be voting for this bill and I urge the body to vote no as well. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Middletown Springs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this budget, I believe, represents the hardest work I've seen an Appropriations Committee do in my time here. It, it took, a virtually, took on a virtually impossible task of, uh, of 
crafting a budget after a time of free spending, of, of uh, largesse, and, um, and worked within a, a, a whisker of the governor's recommend. They appropriately adjusted what the priorities are to reflect the priorities of this body. Um, I think nobody's entirely happy with it. Everybody has something that they can uh, complain about, including me. But uh, overall, I think the Appropriations Committee has done a, a truly remarkable job of putting money where it is most effective, of setting up the budget for f more funding in future years, particularly with priorities like housing. Um, and uh, I will be supporting this budget, both for what it brings this year, but also for what it enables us to do in outgoing years, in coming years. So while there are disappointments and things to um, complain about, there are also, there's also much to celebrate. And I hope that uh, this chamber will join me in, in the groundswell of, of rational exuberance. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Virgence. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think prior to our even arriving here in January and uh, then even becoming more clear as we uh, took a look at the FY25 budget, uh, uh, I've it was going to be a year where returning back to normal was going to feel rather uncomfortable and less, especially after the amount of investments that we were able to make with ARPA dollars and other things that it freed up and making those critical, really, really high uh, dollar value into housing and other, and other things that we've been. But, um, it was, it's tough. It's tough to be able to come back to what would be considered a normal, staying, living within your means, bringing things back that normally had a $18 million investment in the year before, now has, has comes back to one. Other, other smaller things that are not done in here that the governors recommend if we were tolling that to heart, which I think the, the body will be hearing a housing bill later, because of returning to normal in this budget, you could say it reduces the housing investments by 80 to 90 percent from where we were last year. An 80 to 90 percent reduction was not going to serve Vermonters. Um, within the general fund budget, we make some investments, and you're going to hear later today how a 10-year plan on housing takes us to the next level. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to point out a few things. The, the first is that um, what I heard in the presentation from the members of the Appropriations Committee was uh, time after time saying, uh, we agree with the governor's recommend. We agree with the governor's recommend, and we agree with the governor's recommend. I heard that time after time. Um, and I, I also want to point out that we, um, because uh, we might have a, we, when, when I say we, I'm referring to the House Human Services Committee uh, and the support that we received in this budget from the House Appropriations Committee, and with particular note to uh, substance use uh, services and programs, while we may have had differences of opinion with the governor's recommended budget, uh, we by no stretch of the imagination uh, did not address substance use in this budget. And I'll just give you uh, some idea of what that, what that means. It funds a million dollars in stabilization beds. It funds syringe services recovery housing, recovery housing scholarships, recovery uh, contingency management services, prevention coalitions, uh, student assistance programs, uh, criminal justice and uh, the intersection of criminal justice and substance use, uh, residential treatment, um, it, public health specialists. And oh, we did 
uh, even managed to figure out a way to support a grant specialist to assist the Department of Health in managing um, the massive amounts of additional um, uh, responsibilities that they have as a result of this. So I just wanted the body to uh, understand that this budget, uh, during a very difficult budget year, uh, does address the needs of vulnerable Vermonters. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this bill. Primarily, I want to thank the chair for her focus on the issues in the case of our committee for the housing crisis and for some of the social equity work that we have been doing as a body for the last several years. Um, the governor's recommend omitted um, some appropriations, some by mistake and some just because of the tight budget. And this committee worked really hard to restore though that funding in order to maintain the promise that we made when we undertook the process of forming a land access opportunity board and a truth and reconciliation commission which are not necessarily um, they are not public works in the sense of paving roads but they are public works in um, who we are as a state I also want to thank the members who served as the member who served as a liaison to our committee, most specifically the member from Burlington, who struggled along with our committee to understand the limited investments we were able to make in housing in this year's budget. And Madam Speaker, I especially want to thank and to appreciate the whole of the committee from their leadership to the staff that support them every single day. When I started this work in this house in the direct light of the Great Recession, I thought that the power that appropriations had to fund our needs and priorities was otherworldly. And when they did not fund my priorities, I thought the system was broken and that there must have been a way to find the few dollars my priorities needed. And then the pandemic came and we received billions of dollars in federal assistance, amounts of money that we've never received before. That in short actually saved our systems. Without that money, this state would have shut down several different ways. That amount of money felt generous, but it allowed us for a few months overall to solve the homelessness problem and to keep homeowners and renters in their homes as well as up to date on their utilities. And it kept the landlords whole as well with direct payments for back rent. And then these programs ended and the long tail of the revenue ended after last year's session. This year, the committee was faced with a decrease in income from the federal government and needs that far exceeded our ability to pay for them while staying in the so-called box. Those of us who served prior to the pandemic know all about austerity budgeting, where we have to fund programs within the strict confines of incoming revenue. It sounds simple, but it never is, not with the sheer number of needs that we have. This committee and their staff gutted through this long process and in our interactions with them gracefully. They worked on Mondays, they worked late into the night, and they made some incredibly difficult and emotional decisions along with some very difficult puns from one particular person. Um, but especially over these last two weeks, I am grateful for the service, even the puns, and for the blood, sweat, and tears shed on our behalf. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for the question? Member from Pulteney. Madam Speaker, I always begin my budget floor speech by acknowledging the incredibly difficult task House Appropriations accepts each and every year. They work tirelessly all session to, pre to present a budget to us trying to squeeze everything they can into a box that has a finite amount of space. In other words, a finite amount of resources. I want to publicly thank the chair and the members of the Appropriations Committee for your hard work on behalf of all Vermonters. And I truly mean that. I would also be remiss if I didn't include the massive role and my sincere thanks to the um, 
Joint Fiscal Office in getting the budget here to our floor today. Having said that, while the House budget does not rely on new taxes and only spends slightly more than the governor's budget, we started from a place where the committee had to cut 15 million just to get back to balance. That was achieved by eliminating many of the programs designed to take a bite out of our housing crisis, cutting important investments from the capital budget adjustment we will take up later this week, and implementing a vacancy target that will likely result in a hiring freeze. While it will be argued the House is making investments in housing in a different bill, it is being done by an unsustainable and unrealistic amount of taxes. We cannot fool ourselves into believing this is an accurate reflection of a budget. If someone wants to know what our starting point for budgeting next year may look like, you could not rely on this document alone. Our overall budget that is achieved through a combination of bills like H721, H829, H880, H687 and more will rely on additional taxing and spending. I believe in transparency. I believe most of us believe in transparency when it comes to our work here in the State House. To pass bills out of the Ways and Means Committee in a couple of hours without real testimony and vetting and increasing taxes by $131 million is not transparent. You are asking the body to pass a budget that we rely on this money but have not included it in this budget. Some policies are may be included, but the money to support those policies is not. To help reduce spending to get the budget to where it is and what it what is before us today, this budget bur burdens future legislators by taking $5 million of IIJA money, money that will have to be replaced, by the way, and puts current projects at risk. Additionally, it will reduce by $4 million the cash fund. This will increase future borrowing and delay projects in the pipeline. It will require the administration to hold open positions or institute hiring freezes totaling $5 million. I do not support the $131 million in tax increases. I continue to not support a budget that does not include additional taxes and fees. How can I support a budget that will ultimately rely on this revenue to fund programs we have not even voted on? Once again, we are putting the cart before the horse. In this instance, the cart is $131 million. Unfortunately, I will be voting no. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Newfing. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As legislators, we represent the interest of Vermonters. We hear their needs, and we shape our budget and policies to meet those needs. It's our job to support our communities in every corner of our state and create stability now and for the future. This is a fair and balanced budget that funds infrastructure and services that support Vermont families, Vermonters of all ages, businesses, state government, and communities. And it was developed transparently through months of testimony. This budget reflects essential investments in housing, workforce, economic development, human services, and the environment. We are supporting increased reimbursement rates for skilled nursing, supporting food security for older Vermonters by funding Meals on Wheels, restoring critical funding for the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, supporting much needed positions in the judiciary, funding our pension obligations, investing significantly in housing to address our housing crisis, and so much more. I want to thank all of the Appropriations Committee and our excellent staff for all their hard work. Due to that hard work, we're making real, lasting investments that will support Vermonters now and into the future. We're building stronger families, 
stronger businesses, and stronger communities. We are creating a Vermont that works for Vermonters. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for the question? If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrews of Westford. Yes. Two minutes. Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats? Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of an electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during the roll call. When the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so the clerk can accurately record your vote. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Andriano of Orwell. Anthony of Berry City. Yes. Arison of Wethersfield. Arsenault of Williston. Yes. Austin of Colchester. Yes. Bartholomew of Heartland. Yes. Bartley of Fairfax. Yes. Beck of St. Johnsbury. No. Rebecca of Winooski. Yes. Byrong of Regens. Yes. Black of Essex. Yes. Bloomley of Burlington. Yes. Bongrats of Manchester. Boslin of Westminster, yes. Boyden of Cambridge, yes. Brady of Williston, yes. 
Brannigan of Georgia, Brennan of Colchester, Brown of Richmond, yes. Brownell of Pownell, yes. Brumstead of Shelburne, yes. Bert, uh, Burdett of West Rutland, Burger Brattleboro, yes. Burroughs of West Windsor, yes. Bus of Woodstock, yes. Campbell of St. Johnsbury, yes. Canfield of Fairhaven, no. Carpenter of Hyde Park, yes. Carol Bennington, yes. Casey of Montpelier, yes. Chapin of East Montpelier, yes. Chase of Chester, yes. Chase of Colchester, yes. Chestnut Tangerman of Middletown Springs, Christy of Hartford, Yes. Chena of Burlington. Yes. Clifford of Rutland City. Yes. Coffee of Guilford. Yes. Cole of Hartford. Yes. Conlon of Cornwall. Yes. Corcoran of Bennington. Yes. Cordes of Lincoln. Yes. Damar of Venusburg. No. Demro of Corinth. Yes. Dickinson of St. Albans Town. No. Dodge of Essex. Yes. Dolan of Essex Junction. Yes. Dolan of Waitsfield. Donahue of Northfield. No. Durfee of Shaftesbury. Yes. Elder of Starksboro. Emmons of Springfield. Yes. Farley's Rubio of Barnet. Yes. Galfetti of Barrytown. No. Garifano of Essex. Yes. Goldman of Rockingham. Yes. Ghost Lane of Northfield. No. Graham of Williamstown. No. Granning of Jericho. Yes. Gregoire of Fairfield. Mm. Hango Berkshire. Harrison of Chittenden. Hedrick of Burlington. Yes. Higley of Lowell. No. Holcomb of Norwich. Yes. Hooper of Randolph. No. Hooper of Burlington. No. Hooper of Burlington. Yes. Thank you. Houghton of Essex Junction. Yes. Howard of Rutland City. Yes. Hyman of South Burlington. Yes. James of Manchester. Yes. Jerome of Brandon. Yes. Kornheiser of Brattleboro. Yes. Cresnell of South Burlington. Labor of Morgan. La Bounty of Linden. Yes. Lally of Shelburne. Yes. Lalone of South Burlington. Yes. Lamont of Morristown. Lanford of Virgins. Yes. La Russia of Franklin. Lovett of Grand Isle. Yes. Lipsky of Stowe. Logan of Burlington. Long of Newfane. Yes. McGuire of Rutland City. Marcotte of Coventry. Mazin of Thetford. Yes. Matos of Milton. No. McCann of Montpelier. Yes. McCarthy of St. Albans City. Yes. McCoy of Pulteney. No. McFawn of Berrytown. No. McGill of Bridport. Yes. Mahali of Callis. Yes. Minier of South Burlington. Yes. Morgan of Milton. No. Morris of Springfield. Yes. Morrissey of Bennington. No. Merwicky of Putney. Yes. Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington. Nicole of Ludlow. Yes. Not of Rutland City. Yes. Noise of Wolcott. Yes. Nugent of South Burlington. Yes. O'Brien of Tunbridge. Yes. Odie of Burlington. Yes. Oliver of Sheldon. Yes. Page of Newport City. Yes. Payal of Londonderry. Yes. Parsons of Newberry. Yes. Pat of Worcester. Yes. Pearl of Danville. Yes. Peterson of Clarendon. House of Heinsberg. Yes. Priestley of Bradford. Yes. Quimby of Linden. No. Rachelson of Burlington. Yes. Rice of Dorset. Yes. Roberts of Halifax. Yes. Samus of Castleton. Sackwitz Randolph. Yes. Shy of Middlebury. Yes. Shaw of Pittsford. Yes. Sheldon of Middlebury. Yes. Sibylia of Dover. Yes. Sims of Craftsbury. Yes. Small of Anuski. Yes. Smith of Derby. Squirrel of Underhill. Yes. Stebbins of Burlington. Yes. Stevens of Waterbury. Yes. Stone of Burlington. Yes. Supernon of Barnard. Taylor of Milton. Yes. Taylor of Colchester. Yes. Templeman of Brownington. Yes. Yes. Tolino of Brattleboro. Yes. Two for St. Albans Town. No. Tory of Moortown. Yes. Troyano of Standard. Yes. Walker of Swanton. Waters Evans of Charlotte. Yes. White of Bethel. Yes. Women of Bennington. Yes. Williamsbury City. Yes. Williams Graham B. No. Wood of Waterbury. 
Harrison and Wethersfield. Elder of Starksboro. Lamont of Morristown. Logan of Burlington. Mulvaney Stanek of Burlington. Sam is a Castleton. Super not a Barnard. For purpose of explanation, member from Burlington. I vote yes. As the chair of the House Appropriations Committee explained in her floor report, this budget so closely remains within the governor's recommend budget that after accounting for the $12 million pension plus payment, the difference in general funds is within a 0.2% not even one half of 1% difference. In dollars, that's not more than a $3.3 million difference between the House budget and the governor's recommend. Member from Winooski. Madam Speaker, I support the budget before us today with hesitation and concern. We cannot say that we prioritize equity without providing adequate process. We cannot say that we prioritize those most vulnerable and hope the funding arrives later. What we say matters, but what we actually fund matters more. Member from Brownington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I voted yes on this budget because it includes $450,000 for the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, which both supports farmers and those living with food insecurity. Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 104. Those voting no, 39. The ayes have it, and third reading is ordered. Members, at this time, uh, in terms of bill order, we are going to go to 829 and then 879. So, in as an update, we will, after consulting with um, all house leadership, will be taking a dinner break. I'm going to aim to have that happen around 6 or 6.15. Uh, so with that, members, we will now turn to House Bill 829, which is an act relating to creating permanent upstream eviction protections and in housing, enhancing housing stability. The bill was referred to the Committee on General and Housing, which recommends that the bill be amended as printed in today's calendar. The member from Waterbury, Representative Stevens, will speak for that committee. The bill was then committed to the Committee on Human Services, which recommends that the report of the Committee on General and Housing be amended as printed in today's calendar. The other member from Waterbury, Representative Wood, will, will speak for that committee and affecting the revenue of the state. The bill was then referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which recommends that the bill ought to pass when amended, as recommended by the Committee on General and Housing, and when further amended, as recommended by the Committee on Human Services, and when further amended, as printed in today's calendar. The member from Brattleboro, Representative Kornheisel, Kornheiser, will speak for that committee. And then carrying an appropriation, the bill was then referred to the Committee on Appropriations, which recommends that the bill ought to pass when amended, as recommended by the Committee on General and Housing, when further amended, as recommended by the Committee on Human Services, and when further amended, as recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means. The member from Burlington, Representative Bloomley, will speak for that committee. Please listen to the third, second reading of the bill. H829, an act relating to creating permanent upstream eviction protections and enhancing housing stability. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll be reporting on the portion of H829 that reflects the work of your general and housing committee. That can be found on page 2773 in today's calendar. Madam Speaker, we've heard it said every day, it seems, that we're in the midst of a housing crisis. And we've heard right, not just in Vermont, 
but literally everywhere. That lack of uniqueness does not, however, excuse us from trying to come up with solutions that will work for us here in Vermont. Currently across the United States, legislators are wrestling with the same issues. High sale prices for homes, high prices for constructing new homes, for renting homes, Airbnbs, zoning regulations that remain exclusive, and attitudes toward new denser building that may make newcomers feel unwelcome. A need to increase housing for those currently unhoused. Housing for the developmentally disabled, a promise made 30 years ago. We've heard of and contemplated and even passed some small or potential and meaning, meaningful projects that are necessary steps towards addressing our immediate needs. While these steps have been important to addressing parts of the crisis, we come before you today to offer a comprehensive plan to solving our state's housing and homelessness crisis. From investing in the affordable housing we need to ensuring that supports people may need to stay housed to funding shelters for people when emergencies strike. Before the pandemic, we had huge housing problems. Now we all know it intimately. Housing costs through the roof, increased numbers of unhoused in our communities, people unable to take jobs for lack of housing, and on and on. Everyone knows we have a housing crisis and we must address it. Through the pandemic, we received hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government. This money responded to the incredibly deep state of emergency we lived in by being allocated in different ways. Appropriations to organizations for the purchase and renovation of hotel units, the creation of programs to bring out of code units back online, allocations to landlords and property owners for back rent and later for current rent paid on behalf of tenants, programs that subsidize the construction of new homes at a time when real estate sales and construction costs went through the roof, providing shelter to unhoused people and thus strengthening the safety of unhoused people and reducing the need for the services that would have otherwise impacted our communities. This legislative body has been committed to the housing needs of Vermonters. The funding we put forward up until this year has built or will build hundreds of units and houses with state investment. This investment will create perpetually affordable units which will help keep lower income Vermonters housed. Some units have limited affordability covenants, which is an issue down the line. But the goal is to use as many funds as possible for as many perpetually affordable units as possible. But now, Madam Speaker, as we are all aware, those funds have been spent, and in order to continue these successful programs, we will need to invest state dollars, which we know are at an especially high premium this year. With this knowledge, we must also admit that our need for housing has not lessened and that in order to balance the need with the financial capacity at hand. Madam Speaker, to paraphrase a recent opinion piece in the New York Times, the housing crisis is likely to be solved in cities and states, not in Washington, which simply means we will not be able to count on any more funds than we have already received from the federal government while we work on our own solutions to the housing crisis. Further, the tightness of the availability of funds forces us to work on a plan that's cogent and cohesive in a way that is both informed by the successes of development through the pandemic, funded largely by federal dollars, and by the current fiscal reality where we find ourselves back in the pre-COVID place of a more austerity-based appropriations process. H829 is the House's proposal to create a long-term plan to build and provide new housing and services aimed at low and moderate income Vermonters. It is not the be all and the end all, and it does not deal with land use decisions. H829 is the result of a request made to the newly merged Housing and Homeless Alliance of Vermont. And um, we asked, as it passed, as it passed general and housing, it was a legislative structure to a framework provided by HHAV that showed in distinct numbers what it would take to not only build ourselves out of this housing crisis, but how to do it with the appropriate services and with a real price tag. This is a 10-year plan, and HA29 represents the beginning of that process. 
The original framework can be found on our website. Madam Speaker, this report will be in chapters. General and Housing started the work on the bill with a review of what it felt was the policy language with respect to housing programs. Human Services weighed in and provided amendments, and then it moved to Ways and Means, which was responsible for developing the revenue program, and finally to Appropriations. To be clear, the context of this bill is as follows. We have been using ARPA funding to greatly increase the pace of building affordable housing, whether it is in a short-term affordable program like VHIP or for perpetually affordable units, which we are very good at. But at the same time, we've been investing in affordable projects. We've seen an incredible and unprecedented increase in the price and costs related to housing, be it in a purchase or in a rental. Building a project from initial contact with local organizations to ribbon cutting can take three to four years, even with the funding recently made available. Quicker projects may be purchased in renovation um, of hotel units or of rehabbed units through VHIP. These short-term projects will not last as long, but they are answering a part of the need. Bottom line, Madam Speaker, the investments we have made starting in 2020 have borne a lot of fruit. By the end of calendar year 2025, we'll have created nearly 1,900 new units, over 125 middle-income homeownership units, close to 150 shelter beds above and beyond what, we, what already exists, and we'll have improved housing for nearly 200 farm workers. Developers are planning projects based on anticipated funding available. We know we can do this, and we know the best way is to have a framework that will provide a holistic approach to solving the larger housing problems in our communities. H829 is a framework for a cohesive plan that mitigates our housing and homelessness crisis, one that the General Assembly can lead on and succeed. The language that appears in the general and housing portion of the bill is necessarily aspirational. A substantial motivator for us was simply was that if one is going to talk about the housing crisis, we need to take the next step and define what we think it will take to solve it, to start the conversation. You will find the cold reality of our current financial situation in the later amendments. The housing policy in H29 is largely existing. We made some adjustments in some areas and made appropriation recommendations. The other committees adjusted that policy in their areas and made the hard decisions you'll hear about. Key among the policies in H29 are retaining the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, which has funded the rehabilitation of over 500 units thus far. We added language that allows for an enhanced forgivable loan if the rehabilitation was to include deeper accessibility renovations. The language will also allow for VHIP funds to be used for new units, not just units that were out of code. As proposed, funding may be used for units intended for those with developmental disabilities. This is the first year that the program will solely use general fund dollars. H829 also made recommended changes to the Middle Income Home Ownership Development Program, which was created two years ago as the Missing Middle Program. This program allows a subsidy to a developer if a newly constructed home costs more than the appraised value upon completion and can provide a purchase subsidy for buyers who qualify based on income. Run by the Vermont Housing and Finance Agency, this program has created over 130 projects with the money let out already. A further recommendation was for funding policy passed last year in S100 for an upstream eviction protection program, which could prevent approximately 350 evictions. This also recommended was continued funding for the Manufactured Home Improvement and Repair Program, a mobile home technical assistance program, and finally, for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which is instrumental in distributing funds to the nonprofit housing organizations that actually build the affordable units. These programs taken together represent a cohesive plan, as I've mentioned, that if implemented will give us a path that will provide deep investments in low and moderate income homes. These investments will allow our already solid foundation in building out affordable homes and will provide the needed services to make this plan sustainable and successful. So to the bill, Madam Speaker, Section 1 modifies 
VHCB's allocation system under existing law, VHCB gives priority to projects that combine the goals of creating affordable housing and conserving and protecting Vermont's lands, but also considers other factors, including the need to respond to unpredictable circumstances. This section mandates that VHCB consider Vermont's housing crisis in determining its allocation of funds. Section two makes three sets of policy changes to the Department of Housing and Community Development's Vermont Rental Housing Improvement Program, VHIP. First, the section encourages the rehabilitation or creation of accessible units, including by increasing the funding cap for accessible units from $50,000 to $70,000 authorizing the use of these funds for the creation of accessible parking lots, um, parking spots, and deeming certain individuals with disabilities to be a priority tenant for landlords leasing a VHIP unit. Second, this section requires disclosures from DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, to permit the legislature to track when a VHIP unit's affordability restrictions go offline. And third, this section grants DHCD additional flexibility by permitting use of appropriations for administration and by authorizing DHCD to cooperate with and grant funds to other entities to carry out the program. Section three appropriates, uh, actually, I'm not going to mention the appropriations that we requested because they've changed so substantially um, in the further process, but that language, section three, is language of, of an appropriation request from the general fund to DHCD for VHIP. Section four modifies VHFA's Middle Income Home Ownership Development Program in two ways to grant the agency greater flexibility to encourage affordability. First, under existing law, subsidies under the program are capped at 35% of the eligible development costs. This section grants VHFA the discretion to reasonably exceed that cap if necessary to achieve affordability for eligible home buyers. Second, under existing law, any affordability subsidy provided under the program must either remain with the house to offset the cost to future home buyers or be subject to a housing subsidy covenant. This section adds a permissible third condition that the agency may recapture that affordability subsidy for use in a similar program to support affordable home ownership development. Section five simply repeals a duplicative implementation provision for the middle income home ownership development. Section six is the appropriation request. Section seven is also the appropriation request from the general fund to VHCB. And this, this appropriation, if it had been funded fully, would provide support and enhance capacity for the production and preservation of affordable rental housing and home ownership units, fund the construction of preservation and preservation of emergency shelters and find and fund permanent supportive housing. Section eight is a um, proposed appropriation from the general fund to VHFA for their successful first generation home buyer program that provides grants to um, people who are seeking to be the first homeowners in their family. Sections nine through 11 appropriates funds for the eviction prevention initiatives created under S-100. Um, so section nine was to um, appropriate money to CVOEO for the rental housing stabilization services program. It was the statewide program. Section 10 appropriates a million, well, requests a million 25 uh, from the general fund to Vermont Legal Aid for the tenant representation pilot program. And section 11 uh, makes a re appropriation request from the general fund to the Vermont State Housing Authority for the rent arrears assistance program. Again, these are all based, uh, section 11 is based on a successful program that started in 2020. Section 10 is a pilot program. We, we took testimony last year and this is this policy language is actually in law um, where when tenants have representation in eviction proceedings, evictions tend to drop by at least 50%. Section 12 establishes a new resident services program uh, and makes a, an appropriation request from the general fund for that purpose. This section tasks the Agency of Human Services with working with VHCB to establish the program for the purpose of distributing funds to Vermont-based nonprofits or public housing organizations that make at least 15% of their affordable housing portfolio available to families and individuals experiencing homelessness. These funds are meant to aid in responding to urgent resident needs and with housing retention. 
Section 13 tasks the Treasurer's Office with reporting on the developing, development of a pilot program for housing providers to report positive rent payments to consumer reporting agencies to help build tenant credit. The goal is to have draft legislation in the next legislative session. Section 14 grants DHCD additional flexibility under the Manufactured Home Improvement and Repair Program by permitting use of appropriations for administration and by authorizing DHCD to cooperate with and grant funds to other entities to carry out the program. Section 15 is an appropriations request for that program. Section 16 is a, an appropriation request um, from the general fund to CVOEO for a mobile home park technical assistance service team and um, to fund individual resident emergency grants for mobile homeowners to create, uh, to prevent housing loss, remediate unsafe housing, enhance housing safety and provide relief from natural disaster. Section 17 is consistent with the reporting provisions of Act um, 81 from last year. And finally, Section 18 creates an effective date of July 1, 2024. Um, Madam Speaker, I want to thank my committee for working quickly on this bill when we had it in committee. It builds upon programming that's been successful and that we feel when put together like this creates a blueprint for both building out our affordable housing stock as well as our stock that is simply affordable to working Vermonters and the services needed to help keep these apartment, these Vermonters maintain, to help these Vermonters maintain a stable tenancy. The goal of providing more housing, if achieved, will help numerous aspects of our society from education to healthcare. Madam Speaker, your General and Housing Committee heard from the following witnesses. The owner of Longhouse Builders, the Director of Community Relations, the Champlain Housing, Champlain housing Trust, the Housing Division Director from the Department of Housing and Community Development, Legislative Council from the Office of Legislative Council, the Director of Housing Advocacy Programs, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, the Managing Director of Community Development of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, the Director of Policy and Special Projects from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the Vermont State Treasurer from the Office of the State Treasurer, co-owner of Bread and Butter Farm, the Executive uh, Policy Advisor from the Department of Taxes, Clerk of the House of Vermont's House of Representatives, the bill sponsor, and in relation to this material, but for a slightly different bill, the commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development and um, Legislative Council from the Office of Legislative Council. Madam Speaker, the vote in the committee was seven for one, and we ask for the body's support. And now speaking for the Committee on Human Services, member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Your House Human Services Committee appreciated the opportunity to weigh in on this important bill. Our work, our committee's work is focused on those with the very lowest of incomes, or in some cases, no income at all. We are talking about people who have lifelong disabilities, older Vermonters, people who live on Social Security or SSI. We also focus on low-income working families, families who have been forced out of rental housing because of the dramatic increases in rental costs post-COVID. They get up each day, they go to work, they raise their children, and many of them come home to a hotel. They don't want to live there, but if they don't, their other option is their car or perhaps a tent. Our committee has taken testimony from a number of individuals as we've been working on our GA modernization bill, working in state government right now, and their continued focus is on unit creation. We've heard this many, many times, and frankly, we agree. With the proliferation of short-term rentals in the state, 12,000 homes have been taken off the housing market, and that number is growing every day. 
While I believe that property owners should be able to utilize their properties in ways that they choose, we have to realize that this comes at a cost. Realtors are getting calls every day from out-of-state investors wanting to purchase property in Vermont for rental. My family's own experience confirms that. When we sold my parents' home, we had multiple offers above asking price. People seeing short-term rental possibilities wanted to buy the home sight unseen. We made the decision, as we were able to, to sell to a family to think about the neighborhood where we grew up and so cherished. All this is to say, Madam Speaker, is that the housing market has dramatically changed and we need to respond to that. We need to invest in housing in order to create those units we keep hearing about. We need to invest in housing that will make a difference for all of our communities, for our families, and for all Vermonters. Regulatory reform alone will not achieve what we need to do in the next 10 years. A trickle-down effect just does not work on its own. Investment is urgently needed. With that in mind, Madam Speaker, your House Human Services Committee is proposing several instances of amendment to H829, and this amendment can be found on page 2786 of today's calendar. In the first instance of amendment in section one, subdivision A8, um, we are just merely inserting the word uh, affordable after Vermont focusing again on affordable housing. In section two, this is where uh, it's referring to uh, the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, um, and it references a re reasonable percentage. Uh, our committee felt like we should have a little bit uh, uh, closer guidelines to the department, and so we said up to a cap of 5% of uh, the cost of that program could be utilized for administrative uh, costs. In section two, our third instance of amendment in subdivision A5, we strike out the term political and insert in lieu thereof the term governmental. Uh, fourth, uh, this is uh, an area that uh, we uh, individuals would probably consider more substantive. Um, Following in subdivision E to large A, I, following exiting homelessness, we insert including any individual under 25 years of age who secures housing through a master lease held by a youth service provider on behalf of individuals under 25 years of age. This is recognizing that we have youth exiting DCF custody or youth who are otherwise uh, homeless and with the assistance of a youth service agency, uh, they are able to secure housing, uh, but oftentimes landlords do not want to lease to somebody who has no credit history, and this enables that to be uh, easier to access housing for those youth by helping them with this transition. And fifth, in section two, uh, we strike out subsection F in its entirety. This is, again, referring to the uh, VHIP program, and uh, this is with regard to the 10-year forgivable loan aspect of the program. Uh, the five-year forgivable loan aspect of the program includes prioritization for individuals who are homeless, and uh, as we heard from the other member from Waterbury, that has been a successful tool in helping individuals who are homeless uh, achieve more permanent housing. However, in the 10-year forgivable loan program, there were no such prioritization for people who are homeless. And so we uh, essentially inserted the same language from the five-year program into the 10-year program. In our sixth in instance of amendment, um, we are inserting a new subsection. Uh, and the purpose of this is uh, to enable other organizations to, sorry, in section 12, I don't know if I mentioned what section it was in. In section 12, um, we're striking out subsection B and inserting a new subsection B. Uh, the purpose of this subsection is to enable 
uh, other organizations that serve individuals who are homeless um, uh, to be able to provide the assistance, the similar assistance that uh, some individuals receive through the resident managers that are employed by the housing providers. So it enables more choice for the individuals and to not have to have their assistance um, provided by the housing provider. Uh, so we essentially lay out the requirements for that. And then in our seventh instance of amendment, this is in the Manufactured Home Improvement and Repair Program. Again, the term reasonable, per reasonable percentage was used and we inserted up to a cap of 5%. And similarly, in our eighth instance of amendment in section 14, we strike out the uh, term political again and insert governmental. And uh, finally, our ninth instance of amendment um, is uh, to delete in its entirety striking uh, section 17, which is the reporting section that is similar to Act 81. We will be dealing with uh, ongoing reporting of the homelessness situation um, in a bill that would be coming up later in H-879. Um, however, we did insert a new section 17 um, that references the um, ability of a municipality to grant uh, an exemption um, for uh, property taxes. And we inserted in whole, it said in whole or in part, uh, we inserted whole or in part, um, and we referenced the municipal property tax only um, given the state of our education um, fund, and then also looking at adding temporary dwelling units um, that uh, would impact um, the potential for shelters to receive that, um, uh, that uh, exemption. So, um, Madam Speaker, on a vote of 11 0, 0 we passed this amendment. And then further, um, I've got my language here someplace, what we're supposed to say. <laughs> uh, Madam Speaker, your House Human Services Committee voted 11 0 on the amendment and additionally supports 829 as further amended by Human Services on a 7 4 vote and ask for the body's support. Thank you. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We were so grateful for the chair of human services to come visit our committee and um, inform us of the instances of amendment that, that they are recommending. Um, it was a little odd to have two chairs at the same table and one from Waterbury and the other one from Waterbury, but um, I let her call on the witnesses. Um, the committee supports the human services amendment um, by a vote of eight to two, we found that the changes were were more than satisfactory and clarified a bit of the policy that we were aiming to put forward. So we're grateful for their work. And now speaking for the committee on ways and means, member from Brattleboro. Thank you. As you've heard from the members from Waterbury, and as I think we've all heard, we have a stranglehold that our sh housing shortage has put on our economy and our state budget. According to the most recent available data from 2022, severely cost burdened households or those paying more than 50% of their income for housing includes approximately 37,000 Vermonters. That's almost 20,000 homeowners and 17,000 renters. We all know people who have struggled to hire, to accept jobs, to pay their rent, or to find a way off the streets. This puts tremendous pressure on our state economy and on our general fund and on our education fund, and most of all, on Vermont families. Something has to change. And in fact, many things need to change. And we did much of that work yesterday and last week as we set goals into statute, as we re revised our planning and our zoning work as we just passed in our budget and then today in this bill, H-829. In 2023, only 228 new homes for sale were built in Vermont, down from 363 in 2020. In Wyndham County, where I live, there were only seven built and the median price was $1.5 million. 
We must intervene to level the playing field for regular Vermonters. With regards to rentals, the picture is a bit different. Our existing investments that we've made in the last few years with our housing bond and then with federal dollars are working. But we need to sustain them to see success with consistent funding, consistent policy, and consistent attention and planning. Over 700 apartments should be coming online in the next few years. But we know we need to keep up that level acti of activity for many years, in fact, for a decade, as the representative from Waterbury described, in order to meet the needs of Vermonters. H829 puts us on the path to sustain and grow this work. We must both plan for the future, reform our land use policies, and invest for the future all at once. As I've been saying, Madam Speaker, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and in fact, we must if we're going to get where we need to go. None of our work exists in isolation, and only by doing all three of these things and more do we stand a chance of making a difference for Vermonters. I'm going to ask for your patience as I read section one of our committee amendment, the intent section. It is the intent of the General Assembly that as funds are available, approximately $900 million will be appropriated from the General Fund over fiscal years 2026 through 2034 to fund programs that advance a long-term solution to Vermont's housing shortage. These funds will support programs that reach a broad spectrum of Vermont residents, including low-income and middle-income Vermonters, families and individuals experiencing homelessness, individuals with disabilities, older Vermonters, individuals in recovery, farm workers, individuals facing eviction, and Vermonters living in substandard housing. Through sustained funding and annual investments, the General Assembly intends to implement this comprehensive and strategic housing plan that yields permanent affordable housing for Vermonters and for communities in all 14 counties. Madam Speaker, with that, I will defer to the member from Virgins to explain sections two through 17, and then I will um, come back to take up section 18. The member from Brattleboro yields to the member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> this is definitely a collection of your um, house chairs that have worked uh, in collaboration on this to get to the, to the finish line. H2, H829. The General Assembly has prioritized housing investments over the last few years. And while we've made a lot of progress, the job is not done. We all hear from our constituents, local businesses, and some of us have experienced this personally with uh, many of our family members and neighbors. The Appropriations Committee is keenly aware of the budgetary pressures we face. That's why we supported a stepped approach that doesn't add extra pressure on the FY25 budget and sustainably envisions spending on housing programs in future years while endeavoring to reduce unsheltered homelessness. I hope that everyone will look at the intent language in the bill as this is our roadmap and guide for not just this year, but for the next 10. While we cannot commit dollars in the future, the intention is to invest in home ownership, the Vermont Housing Investment Program, VHCB, manufactured homes, and more, supporting tens and thousands of Vermonters along the way. This program is aimed at eliminating homelessness and doesn't just build housing, it provides services that are needed. Specifically, we start down this path with a more modest set of spending initiatives, knowing that our budget is tight and the revenue cannot support the full plan just yet. These, in, these in initiatives include, but I start on page, I think it is, Sorry, 2789 of your calendar today with the second instance of amendment, uh, which is adjusting the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, or VHIP, 
at $1 million. All four committees have reviewed this bill, understand the value that we get from this program. With money tight, uh, we also recognize that the program has a carry forward that they can bring into the next fiscal year. We think this program has a proven success ref record, but knowing the significant carry forward, there were other programs that need resources to move forward as a part of the fuller plan. In the third instance of amendment, which is um, amending section six, this is the Land Access and Opportunity Board <clears throat> to $1 million. This program runs through the Vermont Housing Conservation Board <clears throat> and, was re and requested $1.9 million. And we didn't have the resources for it, but we felt strongly, strongly we support efforts to increase equity and improve access to housing for historically mar marginali marginalized communities. A part of that third instance of amendment also uh, impacts section seven, which is VHCB to 7.3 million. It's hard to overstate the value that VHCB delivers to our communities. This appropriation will be directed specifically for its housing programs to support the critical needs of Vermonters. It's not enough and we'll continue to do more. VHCB has been a committed partner to move people out of homelessness and they will be a critical piece of the puzzle to reduce dependency on motels. The third instance of amendment also impacts section eight, which is the refugee housing, 900,000. Both the legislature and the governor have prioritized welcoming refugees and migrants, immigrants to Vermont. Yet we hear over and over again that their housing supports from the federal government are short term. Adding this modest amount helps buy more time for new arrivals to find a permanent place to call home. The fourth instance of amendment impacts section 12, the, the resident service program, 700,000. We are asking our community, non, our community nonprofit partners to do a lot more to address our housing crisis where we have the second highest rate of homelessness in the nation. This new effort installs a small, and yet not enough, amount of residential services to support people living in our affordable housing. The fifth instance of amendment touches section 15. DCF's Office of Economic Opportunity at 2.7 million. When we build shelters, as we are with VHCB dollars, through last year's budget, this year's BAA, and in the FY25 budget, we need to appropriate money for services and operations. This envisions support of 50 beds going that are either coming online soon or will be next year. Currently in the bill already without um, impact in this amendment is in section 10, the eviction prevention programs at $3.9 million. This body has passed these three policies three times only to see us lack the resources at the end to implement them. This will increase representation for tenants in Lamoille and Windsor counties under a pilot program, provide back rent and offer navigation services to low income residents. You can see that this multi-pronged approach, but I won't say it's comprehensive enough yet, that will come, ne that will come next year and in the future years. We want to invest in home ownership, more housing production, additional services, and ultimately give people security, stability, choice, and opportunity. The vision in this bill and this first year is a small first step, and we ask for your support. And I now yield to the, uh, the member from Brattleboro. The member from Virgins yields to the member from Brattleboro. 
Madam Speaker, one of the extraordinary things about this bill um, is the planning work behind it. And as the member from Virgins explains, the investments that we make this year and next year will enable us to broaden the investments in out years. As we invest in emergency housing, as we invest in shelters, as we invest in eviction prevention, that enables us to keep more people in their homes so that we can continue building. So that our each investment we make can be used as effectively and efficiently as possible. In H829 in your Ways and Means Amendment, we fund this new investment in housing with two different sources that your Committee on Ways and Means has been developing since we arrived in January. We expand a long-standing dedicated revenue source, the transfer tax, and add new revenue to our general fund to support this needed and necessary long-term investment and planning. The transfer tax has been part of Vermont real estate transactions since 1967. The tax was increased in 1988 as part of Act 200, Governor Cunin's landmark and leg legacy legislation. That was a hard one. The transfer tax is made, increase was made with a commitment to taxpayers that the resulting funds would be used both by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board for housing and conservation investments, as well as to strengthen regional and local planning to better manage growth and support regional planning commissions in delivering a wide array of services to municipalities. And I think we have already spoken about the importance of both of these things last year and yesterday and today. The updates proposed in the amendment to H829 have the effect of reducing the transfer tax for lower cost properties and increasing them for higher cost properties. The brackets now for the first time have inflators attached to them so the brackets can shift as our property values rise. Madam Speaker, the promise of the transfer tax is a real key part of how we enable Vermont communities to stay as strong as they are. When initially designed, the idea was as spending on real estate transactions go up, as real estate values go up, more attention and more resources must, by necessity, be spent to develop affordable housing and to conserve. And in doing that, and in continuing to invest in that and broaden our investment and our commitment to that, in a year such as this, where we have seen property values skyrocket throughout our communities, means that we might be able to retain the kind of communities that Vermonters care so much about. Communities like my own and like, like yours, where we have profound socioeconomic diversity within even a single town. That is something that other states do not have. And even in my own community, incredible socioeconomic diversity on even a single street. And that is a powerful part of why our communities are able to have conversations, why are we, we're able to make some of the tough decisions we do, and I think in some ways why this body is actually as dynamic and effective and collaborative as it is. It's that incredible socioeconomic diversity that the transfer tax enables at really an infrastructure level in our communities. So in sections 18 to 24, we adjust the threshold amounts for the transfer tax. The first two tiers of the tax remain the same rate, but those lower tiers are assessed on a larger portion of a property's value. This amendment would increase the $100,000 threshold value for the 1.25 general rate to $200,000 for principal residents, and from $110,000 to $250,000 for principal residents financed through VHFA, VCTF, or USDA RD housing programs. That's USDA Rural Development. Section 18 also adds a 3.25% tax rate for the marginal value of transferred properties greater than $600,000. Together, these changes are estimated to result in $17.5 million in additional transfer tax revenue starting next year in fiscal year 2025 to invest in the creation of new housing and housing stability in Vermont. And um, just a quick preview, that rate and those thresholds are, um, we have a, I have a floor amendment to change those slightly that we'll get to. So I'm not gonna go too deep into them here. I will discuss those further in that amendment. 
It's important to note that we've protected low-income home purchasers by imposing no transfer tax on the first $250,000 in value if the purchaser's mortgage is through a number of financing vehicles, the Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund, the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, or the USDA. The 1.25 rate is imposed on the value above that amount. In all cases, the transfer tax rate of 3.25% is imposed on a value of a property that exceeds 600,000. Again, that threshold will change in a future amendment. It's also important for me to explain that this is a marginal rate. And what a marginal rate is, is that you pay the lower rate up to the threshold value, and then you pay the upper rate on above that value. So if your home purchase, for instance, in this scenario, is $610,000, you would only pay the top rate on that upper $10,000 in value, which would, in both cases, that would represent an actual deduction in what you pay under current law. So we are saving costs for purchasers, purchasers buying a more modest home. The effect of updating the home values in the formula means that people will pay less in the transfer tax and that a home purchase is a once in a generation or even a lifetime event that is negotiated between the buyer and the seller. The revenue from the transfer tax, as I've said, will be invested to develop more housing with a focus on affordable options. More housing represents an opportunity for communities, as I've described, but also for realtors and home buyers. It will help grow our grand list, stabilize lives, and enable us to welcome more Vermonters to the state. As I've said, please look for an amendment that brings us back. Um, oh, sorry, I haven't said that yet, actually. <laughs> Please look for an amendment that will bring us back to the statutory percent allocations that are actually removed in this amendment um, instead of the newer calculations for VHCB distribution and also corrects an oversight regarding clean water funding. That amendment also, as I've said, changes the threshold and um, the percent upwards for the transfer tax. Altogether, the changes in the transfer will raise an additional $17.5 million in revenue towards housing in FY25 and into the future, so we can sustain this essential investment in Vermont communities. Then, in Section 25, we expand an exemption to the transfer tax to the transfer of abandoned properties that are rehabilitated into housing, as that is an important policy tool available to us, in addition to all of the appropriations tools that have been discussed by um, previous reporters. And then this amendment, beginning in section 26, also creates a fifth income tax bracket to raise the marginal income tax rate by 3% for incomes over $500,000. Our joint fiscal office estimates this new marginal rate, this top rate, will increase revenue by an additional $74.9 million in fiscal year 2026. That's one year out. This new rate impacts 1% of personal income tax filers, 1%, and is a marginal rate again, meaning it only applies in the value over the threshold of $500,000. The change in the personal income tax is effective beginning in tax year 2025. Again, that's next year. I would like to name that this section and essentially um, all of the numbers and brackets relating to the income tax code is unbelievably confusing to look at in statute. And I really encourage you to view it in a nice and tidy table form in the fiscal note on the fiscal information tab of the bill. And finally, final section, we changed the title upon um, enactment to an act relating to long-term housing solutions. Your Committee on Ways and Means spent significant time this session understanding the distribution of wealth in our state. In recent decades, incomes of the top 1% of Vermonters have increased rapidly, while wages for the majority of Vermont residents are not keeping up with inflation. Yet these individuals are currently paying a lower share of state and local taxes than many middle-class Vermont families. Reinstatement of a fifth tax bracket for families enacts needed updates to our tax code as income distribution and needs have evolved. By raising revenue from those most able to pay, we are ensuring that our state can fund crucial public investments such as these that will make Vermont more affordable and livable for all Vermonters. 
With this legislation, we are responding to pressing needs across the state, investing in communities' growth and vitality. Here in Vermont, we must continue to make adequate, fiscally responsible pus- public investments such as this, ensuring that our state's revenue streams are strong and sustainable. Today, we're doing that by investing in the planning and development of new housing solutions for all Vermonters. Your Committee on Ways and Means heard from the following witnesses, Fiscal Analyst from the Joint Fiscal Office, Legislative Counsel from the Office of Legislative Counsel, Director of Community Relations of the Champlain Housing Trust, the Advocacy and Public Policy Director from the Vermont Association of Realtors, a Senior Fellow from the State Fiscal Policy Team at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the Interim President of the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center, the Founder of One Day in July, a Senior Advisor for the State Tax Policy Center for the Budget and Policy Priorities, the President and Founder of O2 Strategies, LLC, the Executive Director of the Public Assets Institute, the Research Director for the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, the Executive Director of the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission, and the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Madam Speaker, Vermont communities and families must be the state's top priority. We spent a great deal of time yesterday discussing the housing crisis. It's time to listen to Vermont's people and raise the revenue necessary to ensure that everyone's basic needs are met and our state's housing infrastructure is strong. Our committee vote on this amendment was 840, and I ask for your support. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We appreciate the Chair of Ways and Means coming to our committee on two occasions to explain both this amendment and the following one. Um, your Committee on General and Housing um, voted 903 to find this amendment favorable. And the other member from Waterbury. Uh, Madam Speaker, we did not take a straw poll on this amendment. All right, so now speaking for the Committee on Appropriations, member from Burlington. House Appropriations welcome the opportunity to review H-29 as amended by House General and Housing, further amended by House Human Services, and finally amended by House Ways and Means. House Appropriations passed the bill without further amendment on a vote of 8-4-0. All right, members, at this time, we are going to recess for dinner. Um, The House will stand in recess until the fall of the gavel at 7 p.m. sharp.